this up. Okay, um, welcome everybody to the January Police Commission uh, meeting. Um, this will be a, sh a shorter meeting today, but I want to start by wishing everybody a happy new year. Um, you can use this time to um, review the agenda. And uh, can we get a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make the motion. Can we get a second? No. Thank you, Alan. So we have our our agenda has been approved. Um, our previous meeting, we reviewed um, procedure 1218 um, Narcan. And we also met with um, Constantine Severe. And he came down from, he works in Salem, but he came down from Portland and he um, spoke with us here for the meeting. Um, we, in this past few years, I had the, um, and you did too, um, had the opportunity to work with a commissioner who, um, is no longer on the commission, but I can tell you right off the bat, he, he did a lot for us. And um, and I appreciate his valuable um, wisdom. Um, we have um, Deputy Chief Adams will um, has a presentation for him. Thank you. Uh, v, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Outstanding. Hey, uh, first of all, uh, in of order, just uh, in order real quick, can, can we vote on approving the agenda? Yes. Um, and thank, thank you, Scott. Um, all those in favor for the agenda, please um, say aye by you raising your hands. Aye. No's. They've been approved. Thank you. Now we'll get back to um, very good. Uh, Chief Skinner couldn't be here tonight. He's off at the uh, Chiefs Conference. Uh, but V, I, I understand you've already had a chance to connect with him. Uh, but on behalf of the police department, we, we'd really like to present you with a certificate of appreciation. If you bear with me while I, I read this, V Wynn, uh, your work with the Eugene Police Commission has been has served the community honorably since September 14th, 2020. You provided valuable insight on countless police policy and procedure reviews and subject matter, including law enforcement, mental health and wellness, downtown safety, use of less lethal force for crowd control, diversity, equity and inclusion, community outreach and recruitment efforts to hire officers of color and gender inclusivity. You were instrumental in advocating for, uh, for transparent community centered approaches to policing, which helped the Eugene Police Department in creating a safer and more inclusive approach to policing. You, your stewardship, perspective, and collaboration has been a great asset to the community and will be missed. Because of the great work that you have accomplished through the Police Commission and for the Eugene Police Department, you are hereby awarded the Eugene Police Department Certificate of Appreciation. Thank you for your service. And it's signed by Chief Skinner and Mayor Dennis. Well deserved. Just a couple of brief comments. V, um, you know, we think about uh, law enforcement being a team, and quite often we think about, you know, what makes team, what builds unity. And in every team, there's impact players. And I, I will tell you from my observation from the outside, watching the work of the commission and your work, uh, you've been an impact player for this commission and for this city as a whole. So I'd like to personally thank you for that. So thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any words, D? Absolutely, yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Deputy Chief Adams. Uh, I am, you know, I'm just really humbled by the privilege of accepting this uh, certificate of appreciation. Uh, my time on the commission has been, you know, just an amazing experience, and I owe it all to each and every one of you. Um, 
And, you know, as I reflect on my experience, um, I'm just, you know, filled with a sense of pride for the contribution that we've all made together. Um, the amount of work we've done together, um, you know, just being a bridge for the community between the police commission, uh, police uh, department and the community has just been, you know, invaluable um, for the city. And so, you know, my, my heartfelt thanks, you know, to each and every one of you for your support, you know, throughout my time on the commission, you have all taught me something and I will cherish that, you know, forever. Um, and I've had, you know, the wonderful opportunity to work with you, uh, Deputy Chief, um, on, on a couple of, you know, instances. And I can't, you know, I just can't rave enough about the department and, you know, your leadership, uh, Chief Skinner's leadership, and, you know, the dedication all the officers have in, you know, keeping our community safe, and then also, you know, keeping your ears open and keeping your, you know, um, just, you know, just being open to new ideas and new, um, uh, you know, new connections that you can make, you know, um, to, to enhance the, the work that you do to keep the community safe. Um, and just one instance, for example, was, you know, when the uh, Chinese, uh, Oregon Chinese Coalition had reached out to me and trying to get, um, you know, somebody from the department to come out and do a presentation at their uh, event. Um, I, I know that, you know, um, Chief Skinner was out on, I think, on, on a conference but you have reached back to me right away uh, and were just, you know, genuinely interested in, you know, uh, trying to make uh, as much of accommodation as, as the department could. Um, and, and so I really, you know, I, I can't, you know, I just can't thank you enough uh, for the dedication and the, uh, you know, the support that you've shown. Um, and then to each of you, you know, seriously, you know, I... <laughs> I, I, I'm just really speechless, you know, at, at thinking about, you know, the, the amount of, you know, uh, the wealth of knowledge, the wealth of experience, the wealth, I mean, the, the, uh, the genuine, you know, interest in trying to, you know, uh, make the city, you know, better by connecting the police department with the community. And so I, you know, I hope that our paths will cross again in the future, really, and um, and just, you know, continue the good work that you all do. Thank you. Great. Holly, one, one more thing, sorry. Mm -hmm. Holly, I also wanna say, you know, a, a, a shout out to you for your, for your support for the commission, uh, for the time I've been there and uh, going forward, you know, you are invaluable to, to the commission, really. Um, and I know that, you know, your, your work, um, is, is, you know, uh, just as important as all the commissioners, you may not have, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the votes, but really your support in the background and the work that we do, um, is just, you know, immensely, uh, uh important. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, moving forward. Um, hopefully okay. everyone has oh, oh, speak. hopefully everyone has um, reviewed um, December um, 2023 minutes. Does anyone have any changes or we can if we have any changes address them if not, we can um, vote on Commissioner um, Vice Chair Hawkins. Thank you, you Chair Boggs. Yes, on page four, so page four of the packet, I believe it's actually page three of the minutes. Um, in the continuation of the brief from the Law Enforcement Mental Health and Wellness Subcommittee update, uh, it looks like probably about the fifth bullet point down, performance evaluations item two. Uh, the minutes state when an officer undergoes a PE or performance evaluation, it is categorized as a critical incident. And that is a, a misrepresentation. And I haven't watched the recording to know exactly what the words were that were used, but I wanted to put on the record that that's not how, how that part of it goes. Okay. Are there any other? So would anyone like to make a motion that with changes that Vice Chair Hawkins had just stated? 
that um, they become approved. Do we have a motion? Chair, um, excuse me, Commissioner um, Lemon. As, yeah. as, do we have uh, a second? Motion as, as amended. As amended, yes. Commissioner um, Dr. Booker has seconded. All those in favor with the minutes as with the, with the changes, say aye by raising your hands. All those opposed, the ayes have it. And one and one abstain. All right, we're going to start off with liaison reports and then in our commissioner comments. But since this is the start of the year, I, I'm incorporating a little bit of an icebreaker. So when when before you do your um, comments, if you could um, tell us where you're where you were born and also what is your favorite food, born and whatever your favorite food is, and I'm going to start with. Commissioner Dr. Booker. All right. Um, let's see. I was born in Arkansas, uh, raised in the South. Um, um favorite food. Uh currently I'm on a fast, so uh, uh fruit. <laughs> fruit. <laughs> Fruit is my favorite food at the moment. So um, I'm eating a lot of pineapples and oranges and apples and star fruit and all that kind of stuff right now. So I'm on a detox. Okay. Of course, and, and, oh. and, and, and I'm going to come back around for the um, for the comments. Uh, okay. I'm going to get that where you're from and, and your favorite food. Um, Commissioner Dominguez. Um, ahem. Well, I feel like this is unfair. I was technically born in Los Angeles, California, but I was raised here, just so you know. I only yeah. lived there for three years of my life. Um, and uh, favorite food? Uh, I feel like food isn't very good without a hot pepper, so some kind of hot pepper. Great. Vice Chair Hawkins. I was born in Seoul, South Korea. And I, my favorite food is just about anything with carbs. So pasta, bread, sugar, cupcakes, you name it. I will stuff my face full of it. <laughs> Mr. Lemon. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm, I'm from a very small military town from a military family in Arizona. Um, so certainly shaped the way I think. And my favorite food, because I'm from Arizona, is anything Mexican. Outside of seafood, but anything Mexican, put it on my plate. I'm going to eat it. That's great. Counselor Ye. Thank you. So I was born and raised in Medford, Oregon, not too far away. Um, and my favorite food, I think by quantity of, of what I eat is probably popcorn. I eat an absurd amount of popcorn. Um, so... It's a little bit embarrassing to my husband, but um, <laughs> that's my answer. Good. Counselor Zelenka. Yeah, I was uh, born on Long Island, New York, but like Bonnie moved when I was two to the Bay Area in Sunnyvale, California, which is the Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, by quantity, my favorite food would be potato chips. But my favorite food right now is... Uh, um, I just made it an hour ago, homemade Caesar salad dressing for Caesar, chicken Caesar salad. That's great. Commissioner Bogart. Uh, hello. Um, so I was born and raised in Los Angeles, and I have no regrets about that. Go Dodgers. And my favorite food by quantity is the same thing that I is my favorite thing anyways, tacos. Any kind. Uh, Commissioner Shivers. Yeah, uh, I I was born in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I moved out here seven, eight years ago now. Um, and uh, I don't know what my favorite food is, uh, but I've been um, roasting a lot of broccoli and um, trying to eat a little bit healthier more recently. So I'm not going to dwell too much on what I actually enjoy. <laughs> 
Mr. Lehman. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was born and raised in New York City on the east side of Manhattan. And um, clearly, I don't discriminate. I, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I had the most time to think about it, and I really can't say a favorite. So everyone has named things that I truly enjoy. So <laughs> the quality is the quality. Thank you. And welcome, welcome back to our um, commission, Officer Navesha. So go ahead and tell us where you're from and what your favorite food is. Yeah, I'm from Eugene, Oregon, so I'm homegrown. Um, and my favorite food is my grandma's recipe for seafood gumbo. Oh. Sergeant Smith? Well, I was born in Florence, um, Oregon, but raised in Oak Ridge, Oregon. And my favorite food are chilarinos. Holly? Uh, I was born in Portland, Oregon, and my favorite food is Mexican. I love it. All Anything and everything Mexican. Love it. <laughs> that the cheap battle? Well, I was born in New York as well. Uh, I've lived in Houston, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada, before getting down here to Oregon. And um, pizza. It's kind of pizza. <laughs> Any kind. Good. And, and I was born in Petersburg, Virginia, and my favorite food is Louisiana gumbo. I had it written down before, so there's two of us that love the gumbo. We got to find some good gumbo. We, can have. we need to do a potluck, Chair. Yeah, we had to do a, we had to, That sounds great. All right. Um, as far as um, Commissioner, um, let's start off with liaison comments. Um, Councilor Ye. Um, I do not believe I have any comments, but thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Zelenka. I don't have any comments at this time. Thanks, Chair. Councillor, uh, excuse me, Commissioner um, Lemon, for your comments. Yeah, yeah. no, um, uh, so, um, the Human Rights Commission was, um, I already updated you on, on several of the events that we had in December, but the it was really beautiful on, on the solstice when we had the um, Homeless per Persons Memorial Day. We had the, the Raging Grannies there. It was, it was a very solemn but very important moment for us to understand and realize how many people that we have lost in our community due to homelessness and systems failures. Um, so very heavy but um, also very important. And um, we did not meet you know, in December, we were on holiday break, so I don't have any other updates out of that. And um, just for my commissioner comments, just um, I'm so glad I survived 2023. Happy 2024 to all of you. Um, and I am doing my best to not let the perfect get in the way of the good outside of other things, but um, let's keep doing our work. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lehman. Uh, the Civilian Review Board did not meet this week in January. It did meet uh, in December. I was not at this meeting in December, but there was a, a, a good discussion about a, a use of force incident. Uh, and my nine-year-old mother said um, that we should say good luck for 20 for <laughs> so I don't know what to make of that but uh, I think she's uh, she may be on to something but I'm, I'm grace and hoping for a good year with with for everyone yeah and thank you <laughs> Commissioner Booker uh, uh, no comments Commissioner Dominguez um so I was on vacation in December, uh, but uh, on Sunday, I will be following up on checking to see if I can set up that event with Beatrice, and I will be following up with Beatrice, and then Commissioner Lemons, I am sorry, I will also be following up with you, because after, yeah, I emailed you twice, but you emailed me back, and I'm sorry, I did not email you back, so anyway, um, thank you, and oh, and sorry, we were talking about um, homelessness and Eugene, and specifically, um, um, why it is that we can, in the city of Eugene, be asked for three times rent. So I will follow up on that, Scott Lemons. And thank you. Okay, that's all. Mr. Shivers? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm sorry to see V go. I know it won't be the last uh, the last time I see him. Uh, so um, 
other than that, I'm excited to keep up the work with everybody in this new year. Mr. Mogar. Yeah, hi. Um, so I know that I was affected by the the internet outage, and I know that there are still people that are dealing with that situation. And from what I've heard, um, there were a number of towers that were down. So that sounds like it was a coordinated effort. Sounds like domestic terrorism to me. Um, like to little know a little bit more about where the department is with that investigation and with what's going on with that. And uh, sorry to hear about the young man that died here in Amazon, the Amazon area, um, over by the high school. Uh, I know we have our, our hands full of the different things that are taking place right now, but it's uh, it's worrisome situations. Vice Chair Hawkins. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for the commissioner comments, uh, I actually have a tour of the jail scheduled for Monday the 29th, and Lieutenant Moore of the jail has uh, said that I am welcome to extend that invitation to any of the other police commissioners who would like to join us. So that is Monday the 29th from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., and if anybody's interested, let me know and we'll definitely get coordinated with Lieutenant Moore. Um, the, on the website, it says that you have to have a group of six and no greater than nine. They said that is outdated. That was back when folks were voting on the jail levy and they had swarms of people trying to tour the jail. Um, but they are happy to accommodate a tour anytime somebody wants. Uh, Chair, did you want me to segue into the law enforcement, mental health and wellness or, yes. or hold off? Okay, no. so we have not had a meeting on that. We moved our January meeting, so it will be held next week. And we have a couple of guests coming. One of them is the psychologist who does EPD's pre-employment screenings. And so we are definitely looking forward to hearing from her as far as what she looks for and how she performs those evaluations and potentially any disqualifying factors. Okay. Next is our chief's report, and that will be done by Deputy Chief Adams. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so great to see everyone again today. And uh, once again, Chief Skinner is off at a chief conference, so unfortunately he can't be here. Uh, chief left me no uh, talking points, so uh, apparently he must have covered everything he wanted to cover last meeting. So just to talk about uh, a couple things, obviously the chief hits on hiring every time he comes. We are swearing in. Very happy to be swearing in five new police officers tomorrow. So, um, and the academy has uh, ramped up. Uh, there were some legislative efforts that went on. And if the chief's not discussed this, we've now uh, doubled the amount of recruit classes that are going through the academy, which what that means for us is our turnaround from our hiring to actually get our officers into field training to ultimately see them soloed out uh, has exponentially increased. So that's a very, very good thing bare minimum from start to finish from the day that an officer spends uh, their first day here with the police department till they're potentially soloed out in their own car is uh, 42 weeks. So, and it could be quite a bit more beyond that depending on what academy dates are. So, and that's that's set up in, in, in how we do our training and make sure we maintain our certification. So uh, I'd also like to touch upon that it is human trafficking week. And um, we have a media blitz that has a will be going out featuring my mug. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but anyway, uh, it is human trafficking week and we do have a special unit, our special investigation unit that does have all, handle all our human trafficking complaints. And uh, we do see them. And most of the time in this region, we don't see a international trafficking. Um, we don't see a good portion of the uh, domestic servitude where uh, the, group, the classic example is somebody comes over from another country under false pretenses to live with somebody, and then they become financially independent and can't get back. A domestic servitude is, is kind of what that's referred to. Uh, mostly what we see here is sex trafficking, uh, and we do run uh, the occasional operation to try to interdict those as, as they're going on. So uh, just some awareness on Human Trafficking Week. Uh, if you've not seen our, our release, you know, quite often human trafficking, when we talk about the sex trade, is referred to as a victimless crime, and it is anything but victimless. And so that's the mentality that permeates through this police agency and how we approach that work. So 
Uh, and then last but not least, uh, Commissioner Lemons, I just wanted to address for a minute, I see in the notes that the Chief Skinner uh, didn't talk about the downtown cameras last session, and it's timely because we're going to talk about them again here. Uh, during our last session, you would ask me about our downtown cameras, and I did do some research after that. Uh, and you had mentioned, and I'd have to look back at my notes where you had seen these cameras. Uh, I have confirmed that we only have four uh, total cameras. Three are currently up, and every camera is distinctively marked with Eugene police and indicating a camera, including a flashing blue light. So some of those other cameras that we're seeing downtown are private businesses and otherwise, and they're not they're not our cameras. And the other thing that also is downtown is the parks department does run some cameras for parking services. Again, those aren't our cameras either. So we have four cameras downtown. Uh, well, three right now with the fourth uh, to be mounted, and they are fully completely marked. Chair, that's uh, really all I have. Unless there's questions. Oh, uh, if I may, just one more. Uh, Commissioner Mogart, uh, the tower uh, outage and downage, domestic terrorism obviously jumps to mind right away when you see a series of these things happening. Generally speaking, those are investigated by the FBI in coordination with local law enforcement agencies. So we'll see, it's too early for us to tell to have a, a direct bearing on exactly where that investigation is going, what we know about it yet, and um, I will proceed investigationally. Thank you, I appreciate that. Do we have any questions? Um, yeah, super quickly. Um, on the on the camera thing, I know it's on our agenda, so I, I can reserve my questions for that agenda item, but I certainly want to drill down. Do we have any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chief Adams. Next on, next on our agenda is continue review of policy 1210 public safety cameras. So we, we're going to um, have um, Julie Smith and um, Deputy Chief Adams kind of go over that. And I'll let you go ahead and start. Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> I just wanted to kind of um, give a little bit of history and background to policy 1210. Um, Previous to the revision, it was actually titled um, Policy 1210 Guardian Trailer System. And that was a sunset, a program that was due to sunset in 2018. Um, if you recall, the department purchased guardian, two Guardian trailers in 2017, had them online, um, and in two, it was due to sunset in 2018 with the policy with the assumption that the program would be continued, but that we needed to codify the policy after we learned um, how the trailers um, worked. And so um, uh, obviously the guardian trailers were a success. We utilized them and deployed them in various projects, incidents, um, we used them for prevention, um, and we continue to use them to present date. Because of the success, um, there's quite a competing interest on trying to get those cameras deployed um, for various reasons. Um, our crime, um, our CET unit um, is the individuals that organize the deployment of those. The downtown um, uh, manager also um, manages the program. Um, there was investigative needs, um, private party requests for those. Um, so in July, um, there was a request um, from our uh, downtown sergeant and program manager for that program for the guardian trailer um, policy to be uh, revised, updated, and codified um, with also the intent to add language to help triage the deployment of that equipment. Um, it had just been um, uh, because of the success and um, request for that, they wanted to establish some guidelines for the department on how and when those can be deployed. So a work group was assembled in uh, in July, which included the patrol captain, their operations captain, the downtown sergeant, the downtown station manager, and the downtown incident commander. Uh, they worked together to revise the policy, um, and th therefore they decided that we should change the title of the policy from guardian trailer project to 
what is now known as the public safety cameras policy um, to codify the whole program. And so that's where you bring it us here today. That was signed by Chief Skinner in September. Um, the revisions were, um, and basically it really addressed the issues regarding the triage for when they can be deployed. Do we, have any, do we have any questions? Questions about what? Like, <laughs> are we talking about the policy now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me start off with um, Commissioner Shivers, and then followed by Commissioner Lemon. Thanks. Um, so, I have two major thoughts. Uh, my first thought is specifically related to the Guardian trailers and the way they're deployed. Um, to give you know direct feedback on that. The most concerning thing that I have seen in regards to the Guardian trailers has been effectively subsidizing private business in their private spaces um, with city dollars. I don't have a, an inherent distaste for um, our businesses. I think it is very important, but for example, the Fred Meyer out on West 11th getting the Guardian trailer 24-7 for two years. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I, Can I interrupt just really quick? Yeah. yeah. Um, that is actually not our camera. That is owned by Fred Myers. Um, because of the success of the Guardian trailers, in, uh, businesses um, have actually purchased their own Guardian Excellent. trailer. Um, and so the Parks Department actually has two um, that they actually purchase and they Handle the deployment of those of uh, their own cameras. I, so anyway, sorry, yeah, I, I will admit I have not you. actually I I have not actually you. looked at the branding of that um, very closely. I thought it was EPD branded, but um, I appreciate that. That is that is yeah. very good to hear. My second point is I know going to be um, jumping in front of a lot of complaints about the downtown city cameras. And that is our community has an interest in safety. It has an interest in safety, particularly downtown. Things that you do in public are not private and are therefore subject to being recorded by camera. Um, I understand that people might feel upset about that, particularly around Kesey Square, but the community has spoken. The community wants more safety. It wants more observation in order to feel safe. Um, that's my opinion on it. Um, and I'm excited to hear uh, some productive ideas about how we can be inclusive for everyone. I'm sorry, who said that? Yeah, so as for the, the Guardian trailers, much like the ones that are the cameras downtown, they're clearly labeled. Um, they have a big badge on the on both sides of it. I, I wish I could articulate better what it looks like, but it is heavily branded. Um, versus like the Fred Meyer one, which it's completely white out and then has a blue light. So it makes you think that it belongs to police. But a lot of businesses are actually adopting that. And I think Winco is another one that has one. So um, just to be aware that we do have some that they're clearly branded. Yeah, I'm just talking about in general, the two spots downtown where I guess three, if you include the one um, up by Whitebird, where um, certain segments of the community feel targeted by having a camera in their presence um, and they feel run out of places as a result of being observed in places. And I think that the community as a whole very much wants to have eyes on these hotbeds of uh, concern. Mr. Lemons. Thank you, Chair. And honestly, I want to second everything that Commissioner Shivers had to say. Um, I'm a big believer in, in freedom of the press. And therefore, yeah, when you're in public, you you can be recorded. And I do that from my personal perspective for the ACLU to record as well. You know, so I have no problems with that. Um, really, what I'm trying to get with all of this is just clarity in the policy and people to understand. So thank you, Deputy Chief Adams, for that update. So there's four total, but three running. I would so first I would like to know and get it on the public record of like where those locations are at. Um and then I really actually appreciate you, Deputy Chief Adams. Like you, you followed through so quickly and, and we're like, here's these cameras and they're and they're fully marked. And I went and uh, I, I checked out those cameras and you're, you're right, you know, like they do have EPD and they have the red and blue lights, but they're two and a half stories up, you know. So we're not considering people who are 
you know, there, there's so many um, different disabilities or even ways of thinking and accessibility. I would like to see the signage as is put in the policy, you know, uh, that it needs to be appropriately, you know, signed. I would like to see those at eye level right below the cameras. Um, so that that's my one thing on that one. Um, when it comes to the Guardian trailers, I would like to know how do you actually measure success? Um, do you have an, like an objective standard or do you just feel that it's working well? And then you touched on like um, you had mentioned that private party requests and you had had one with those of the Guardian trailers. How does that work? How long is the video stored and how long like how quickly could I access that as a private citizen? Uh, and would that be a FOIA request or what's that process look like? And I'll reserve my other questions or comments for now. Oh, 8.1. Yeah, Commissioner Lemons, I'll have to do some research. I have it somewhere of exactly where the uh, cameras are. And I could uh, certainly share that through Holly uh, via, via email. Um, I understand it won't if, if you want to give me a couple of minutes, I can go to my office and, and get the exact location. You can get it, you can get it through email. Yep, I can send it through email. Yep. To Mr. Dominguez. Hi. Um, thank you. Uh so I was wondering, um, uh where in the policy does it say that the uh signs have to be at eye level? If um I don't I don't remember reading that, but does it say that if it doesn't say that, then we should, can we like do like a thing where we like vote on adding that in there somewhere? Because I thought that was a really good suggestion. You, you can make, a, you can make a motion. Oh, okay. I don't have the right language. Um, So if I could get help with that, that'd be great. But I make a motion. Um, Or Scott, would you like to make the motion instead since it was your idea? I'll go. Yeah, I'll go for it. I would, I would like to make a motion that every down or every security camera that is posted by EPD has a signage at eye level. I would second that. Does anybody want to speak? Does anybody want to speak of this? Councilor Zelenka? Yeah, what does signage mean? What do you, you mean like, well, I think there's a reason they're high up, the cameras themselves, because they get a better vantage point and, and they're much more effective. Plus they're not prone to being vandalized. <clears throat> so I suspect that's why they're high up in the air for the most part. So when you say like a sign, like you mean like a little placard? Yeah, yeah. Just you know, a little look up the camera, you're on you're on EPD yes. smile. Which would be more effective. Yeah, just, just, just like the downtown garages have a sign being like smile, you're on camera. Why can't we do the same with EPD? So subsection B of section 1210.6 says that areas monitored by the camera systems will be conspicuously marked to inform the public the area is being observed for public safety purposes. I think we don't need to change the policy. I think the department um, uh, is listening right now to our suggestion at, of eye level signage um, and uh, I hope that they follow through with with the guidelines we're offering. I don't necessarily think we need to change the policy itself, though. But it's already not working, though. And I'm still. But then, if they're not listening to the policy, then adding more to the policy isn't going to change them not listening to it. I, if, it if it's codified I, in in policy, and like that's our why, role. Why don't, why don't we do this? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, Commissioner Limited, repeat your motion again. I know we'll say, repeat your motion so everybody's in the same. Yeah, so yeah, my, my motion is that at every single EPD camera that they employ, that there is a placard or a sign at eye level so everyone knows that they are being recorded. Oh. Right, and it, 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 and it has been seconded by um, Commissioner Dominguez, correct? Uh, yes. However, given what um, Commissioner Shivers was saying, um, maybe we could kind of meld the two together and say under 1210.6B, where it says areas monitored by the camera systems will be conspicuously marked to inform the public that areas being observed for public safety purposes. Maybe just in there we could slip in the eye level thing. Language. So how, are you, so how, so how do you want to word? How do you want to change the wording? Um, 
areas monitored by the camera system will be conspicuously marked at eye level to inform the public the area is being observed for public safety purposes? Or street level, is that eye level, street level? What, what would that be? I would, I would, I would say eye level and I'll take that friendly amendment. Okay. Oh, so, so, so it's been changed to, to, to this friendly amendment? Correct. So those, all those in favor of this friendly amendment as stated by Commissioner um, Lemon and Dominguez, say aye or raise your hand. I have a question. You have a question before we vote? Yeah. Um, as far as the Guardian trailers, uh, how does that work? They're already marked at eye level. They have placards all over them. Okay, cool. Good. Thank you. So those are all those in favor of um, the, the last motion we just passed, raise your hand by saying aye. All those opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. We we'll move on. Okay. Commissioner, Commissioner. Oh, we can take a turn later. Okay. I'll, you can come yeah. back. Commissioner Booker, your hand. I'm recognizing you because your hand has been up. Um. I think uh, Commissioner Lemons are alluded to a little bit about the placement of the cameras. I guess my my question would be, um, why would they? Why would those particular? I have two questions actually. First one is is why were those particular spots selected? I got it. Yeah, those particular spots were were selected based upon crime statistics and downtown surveys regarding feelings of safety and crime. And so that's why those selections were made. And if I may continue, uh, Commissioner Lemons, I do have the locations. They're at 8th and Olive, Broadway and Olive, Broadway and Willamette, and the fourth one will be at 8th and Oak. And, you know, just, just to provide just a little bit more reference here, Dr. Booker, we had one of the precipitating incidents to this was and why we put a guardian trailer downtown at Broadway and uh, all of, I believe it was, we had a series of shootings downtown, um, not last summer, but the summer before. That was the precipitating uh, impotence behind trying to get something down there uh, to try to work towards, you know, at least we could put a visual deterrent up, first of all, but secondly, we got some really good investigative leads out of having that guardian trailer down there. And so it, it's not the that's not the the primary reason why that occurred. It all comes back to crime statistics and the feeling of crime or safety. Uh, but that was one of the precipitating incidents. OK, and it was and it kind of brings me to my second question, because I always want to reference the um, bias hate crime report that came out. And one of the leading statistics in that crime report was vandalism of black businesses. So I was wondering if it's selected by statistics and understanding that black businesses are highly targeted, are any of those cameras placed in those high targeted areas that target black businesses and crime? To my knowledge, no. I would have to do a little more research down there to see if we have a black owned business within that area. I could help you. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a camera um, uh, put in front of Betty Snowden's um, business. Yeah, we did that when, when she um, made complaints. And she made complaints, and and I'm right, I'm right around the corner, and I went and I went and I have helped her, and um, that camera was there for a long, for a long time. So that was an example of um, a black owned business requesting help and she she spoke with me and they, and and we um, brought that camera right across the street there from the by two um yeah. and that was in that area it was heavily um yeah she was she was she was a subject of vandalism so that, well, I, I do know that one, one of the things we have is in you know delineating these fixed cameras versus our guardian trailers the guardian trailer that would be that would drop into our triage list of would we send a guardian trailer immediately to a black owned business that was targeted? Absolutely, we would. Uh, and so those are targeted events like that, particularly more when we're attaching a, a bias to it. 
uh, gets a strong, strong response from this police agency. So we would do that. And that would be one of the things that would be a placement for a guardian trailer. All right, thank you. And, I'm, and I say that in hopes that the statistics, the bias hate crime statistics aren't the same next year. So thank you for asking the question. Yeah. Councillor Zelenka. Yeah, um, I, uh, I think it's very cool that other businesses have, that businesses have actually seen the success of this and, and bought their own. I didn't expect that when we approved these, the original two guardians, because they're not cheap. They're pretty expensive. I think they're like $100,000. Um, so that's interesting. So um, did you say that the, the EPD has two and Parks has two? So that's a total of four. Parks has two. I believe we're up to four now. Is that accurate? Oh, EPD has four. I think we're either three or four, uh, Counselor, in Parks we know has two. Yeah, and speaking of Parks, um, last summer these morons were lighting fires up at the top of Hendricks Park. In the, it was fortunately on the asphalt, but it could have easily gotten out of control. And so the the parks department put up uh, a sign says for fires prohibited and they did it again um and so they put one of the guardians up there and poof the that problem just disappeared uh it was pretty amazingly uh, amazingly effective and so I, I really became a believer of the guardians when for public safety things like that uh when in, in that particular instance because i it's right in my backyard so i walk up there all the time um, I had a question about how do we select the sites that are chosen? I read the policy, but it's not that descriptive. Maybe Chief, you can talk about that. And what's the average length of time something's there? Or does that kind of depend on, on the circumstance? Well, did, hey, Councilor, did you delineating two separate things here. The fixed cameras are up there. And as I mentioned, they're set there because of crime statistics and surveyed feelings of crime in the downtown court. Right. So, I meant mobile ones. Set those aside. Now, our guardian trailers, requests for the guardian trailers will drop into our downtown manager. It's the downtown manager that will triage all the requests. And one of the things that happens is there's input. And so, as I mentioned with Dr. Booker's comments, if we had some type of an event where there was a bias attached to it with a uh, Black-owned business, certainly that would top, top the list of our triaging where we would send the guardian trailers. So at any given time, we probably have dozens of requests to move the Guardian trailer throughout the city based upon crime statistics or even just requests and sometimes even anecdotal information we receive. So uh, the idea behind this is we have one point of contact. Uh, it's done via um, crime statistics, DSW shoes. We had a whole retail theft um, event going on there. Uh, that's obviously one that'll jump to the top of the list when a business is losing tens of thousands of dollars in, in merchandise for from just grab grab and go. So it, it's constantly evolving. It's constantly moving. And kind of like everything else we do as a police organization, we're constantly triaging as to where's the greatest need for this asset. Because unfortunately, right, wrong, or otherwise, it, it's a scarce resource for us. It really is. So hope that answers your question. You're muted. You're muted. Because I've got a crazy puppy here doing all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> um, so the length of time it stays anywhere uh, kind of depends on the circumstance and 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 then the next uh, upcoming triage need. As a general rule, council, we don't like to leave them in position more than two weeks. What happens is there's a visual deterrence for these trailers, as you saw with. Hendricks Park. If you leave it there too long, then people get accustomed to it. It's no longer a deterrence. Uh, so we like to move them around at a period no greater than two weeks. Thanks. Vice Chair Hawkins. I had two questions and DC Adams already beat me to one of them uh, because I was going to ask since uh, Commissioner Lemons had specifically requested that the locations be on public record. I was going to ask if 
DC could actually go and get that information for us, but you beat me to that. So thank you. My other question though, is regarding the private systems that have those blue lights. Uh, as citizens, we're not allowed to just slap blue flashing lights on our cars and drive around. We would get in trouble for impersonating a police officer. So how is that allowed for the other security cameras? I mean, I think we all thought that that the one at Fred Meyer was, was an EPD thing. And so if you have a body of police commissioners that are representing the community coming and telling you, we think we see these cameras all over the place because they have the blue lights, uh, can, can you explain, is there any sort of, of legal Legality to, I guess, to them having a, a the blue lights. Okay. It, it seems misleading. Yeah, that, that's that's a great question. So of course these businesses are going to put a blue light on top of things because they really they're doing a form of impersonating police. Uh, the reality of it is, uh, Oregon Revised Statutes has a specific um, uh, coding in it regarding blue lights on vehicles. So you can't put a blue light on a vehicle that's prohibited. There's nothing that prohibits a blue light flashing on really anything else. So what's going on with these trailers? Completely lawful. It's not unlawful. So we can seriously just slap a blue light anywhere we want? Pretty much, yes. Not on your car. Not on your car. Just yeah. not on my car. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Putting them all over my house now. Thank you there. Right. there you <laughs> on every single ring doorbell camera. <laughs> does that does that include mopeds and motorcycles? Those are vehicles. Okay. Okay. Let's get get to um, Commissioner um, Dominguez. You have your hand up. Uh, yes, I do. Um, thank you. Um, okay. Sorry, there's like a lot of things, so I'm just gonna do a couple. First of all, um, I looked up Overwatch camera, and I can't find what the specific supplier is because there's like a bunch of different cameras that use overwatch as part of their name so can you give me like the actual website for the actual company okay yeah that'd be great um i'd like to learn more um aren't they called guardians guard that's the company name i thought um According to what I saw, I think that's a different system. The Guardian trailer camera system versus the Overwatch camera pod. I think those are two different systems. Is that correct? That's correct. The Overwatch cameras are the ones that are fixed downtown. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then my other question is, um, I read in the policy that like certain people, like individuals could request um, the use of the cameras and when they are requesting it, does that mean that not just like the lieutenant that has the direct, I think it was the lieutenant, direct access to it and like kind of monitors it, like can the other people also adjust where the camera is? Basically what I'm getting at is that it seems like maybe possibly it would be useful if the um, if the dispatchers had access to it. And the only reason that I say that is because I'm assuming that when a dispatcher is being called, if they happen to know that wherever the incident is happening happens to be near a camera, maybe they could focus in on the area. It just seems like it might be useful for them. I don't know how quickly they notify actual police um, or for example, the I, I'm gonna keep saying Lieutenant, I think his name is Paul in downtown. Anyway, um, um, like I don't know how quickly they can notify Paul that you know, it'd be nice if he could like rotate the camera to like point at something. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, could could the dispatchers have access to it? I guess is what I'm getting at. It might just be a, like a nice use of the cameras for immediate things. This is a great idea from officer safety point of view. I mean, if our officers could see on a camera system while responding to a call, what was happening, that's money all day, all night for us, for sure. It makes, makes us safer, makes the community safer. The problem is if we start to open up how much access we have to these computer systems or uh, um, video systems, it, it just becomes too much, first of all. And then secondly, there's different certification levels and a police officer has a different certification level than a dispatcher or otherwise. So there's that comes into play. And then there's training. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of training that has to go in uh, to these cameras. And then ultimately, who's the final decision maker as to, can I access this camera, can't, where do I turn it? I mean, we have to have that confusion of command can be the word where you have too many people trying to make decisions about how you're going to locate this camera. And that becomes an issue for us. So 
it's a great idea, really, um, but it's just it's not practically applicable. And I just like to add on that it's, it, the dispatcher has a lot of responsibilities, um, with multiple computers, multiple calls coming in, multiple monitors. For them to have an additional monitor and to be trying to watch video while they're trying to answer 911 calls, dispatch calls, you know, is um, beyond the scope of what we should be requesting a human being to do. So that's not, um, you know, in fact, they boy actually voice that that would be um, additional duties that they just would not be able to do. Okay. And just to clarify, because I did kind of like was all over the place in my idea. Um, Dispatcher gets call. Person says there are shots being fired across the street from said restaurant or whatever that happens to be near a camera. Dispatcher says, oh, okay. How quickly is a camera searching that area while somebody's actually being dispatched? Like how quickly is the camera like looking around to see where this is happening? If, if we know it's in downtown or near a camera or guardian trailer, Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty quick to access. It's a phone call to our supervisor mm -hmm. uh, who was probably en route to the same call because everybody's probably going to a call like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I I mean, I can't give you an exact time frame, but it happens really quick. Like I would say there's been a couple responses. Um, this is, gosh, like a year ago that I was talking to a coworker um, who responded downtown and within like five to 10 minutes, they actually had like a suspect on video that they were actually able to see. So it, it happens pretty quickly, especially when we don't get good descriptions of suspects or maybe the suspects aren't even seen. Um, so the cameras are able to provide that information pretty quickly. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate that. And then just one suggestion, if I may, um, I think that as far as I understand it, we do not have a policy that covers facial recognition. And I think it would be nice if we were to say that this policy I, like I said, I don't know who the camera supplier is or whether what the capabilities of these cameras are. I would just say that we are not approving, because we don't have any policy that addresses it, we are not approving any facial recognition software from being used. I'd love to add that as some kind of a motion. Um, so you want to make that motion? Yes, I would love to make that motion. Do you want, do you want to get the information uh, first from the camera? Um. From the camera company. We can tell you we are not using facial recognition and do not plan to. And the chief has said we are not using facial recognitions with these cameras. I can tell you that I had that discussion with him. So, okay, that's perfect. Uh, so, could we codify it? However, you pronounce that word. Um, let's see here. Can we say something to the effect of facial recognition technology is not covered by this policy. The use of facial recognition technology by the Eugene Police Department requires a separate policy that is consistent with the law and respects the privacy and civil rights of the public. The use of facial recognition technology during unmanned... Oh, sorry. That's not... I That was a different thought that I was having. How about that? Second. That. Thank you. So we have a, we have a motion on the, on the table. Does anyone like to talk about it? Are any are the hands talking about what what counselor yay? Yeah, I just had a quick question. Are you proposing to put that in the top, like the purpose and scope section? Oh, that would work. That that was my only question. <laughs> oh yes. Commissioner um Lemon, is your question different from what okay, gotcha. Um uh, Commissioner um Shivers? Yeah, I just want to make sure we don't put we don't hide <laughs> an important element in this policy when it's applicable to multiple. I do think we should include something, but uh, the the motion that Bonnie made was a little bit uh, all-encompassing. Um, it would include um, body cameras and everything else. And if we go that route, we're going to end up putting it in every policy, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but... Um, uh, something a little bit simpler would be my preference for for this well, policy. I think you're reading about body cameras. Um, do you, do you want? What, can can you repeat that motion? Ah uh, yes, facial recognition technology is not covered by this policy. The use of facial recognition technology by the Eugene Police Department requires a separate policy that is consistent with the law and respects the privacy and civil rights of the public. I do understand, um, Sean, that under the uh, what is it the unmanned aerial systems 
I think we do briefly also talk about um, uh, facial recognition technology not being used there as well. Um, I had not, it had not occurred to me about body cameras. Um, so I'm wondering, are you suggesting that maybe that should be just a policy on its own or something? Is that what you're saying? I was just saying that for this policy specifically, instead of saying facial rec recognition is not covered under this policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just saying uh, facial recognition is not permitted. Oh. Period. Just keep it very simple um, and and clear. And then if if something happens where it comes up that it's useful in some way, uh, that will be a bigger conversation rather than um, saying, oh, it's not covered by this policy, but you know, our uh, our cameras in the lobby aren't aren't public uh, guardian trailers, so we're going to use facial recognition technology there or whatever. Um, and so, just so my, question, my question for Commissioner Dominguez is that fine with you? Because I'm fine with either way. You like um, you like the shorter version? I'm not following um, what Commissioner Shivers is saying. Um, so that's my hesitancy. Well, right now we're dealing with we're dealing with um, cameras. Yes, I I feel not, not body cameras. We're dealing with the cameras that we discussed. We yeah, exactly. And the motion, I, I would support Bonnie's motion if it was just the first sentence, which I think is what Sean is saying. Otherwise, it's too broad for me. It's 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 just. But if you just want to say this policy, facial recognition is not permitted under this policy. I think everyone agrees that's that's the case. That's where we're at. And just oh, as a okay. reminder to all of us, we're not writing the policy. No. The chiefs can adopt the policy. Right. We're making the recommendation. Right. And right. I believe that that I, I would support it if you just limited it to that. So it does that work? Yes, does that, that work? Yes. So could if okay. So I feel like that makes sense to me. We can add that to this, and then later maybe we could create a policy that. Talks okay. About so that. let's let's start with this. Let's start with this. Okay. So we're all on the same sheet of music. We'll fine tune this. What is the short version? Who can say it? I motion that facial recognition technology is not covered by, or not covered and permitted by this policy. And it's seconded by um, Commissioner Lemon. Yeah, and, and I'll keep my second with the caveat that we will discuss any facial recognition policies that might come through down the road and it has to be discussed with the police commission. That's what we do. That's what we do. That's fine. Yeah. So All those in favor there. of Commissioner Dominguez's um, motion, raise your hand. Aye. All those opposed? I, I oppose. We have one opposed. The ayes have it. So uh, commission, Commissioner Dominguez's motion has been approved. Next, we have um, Commissioner... Um, Chair. Lyman. My Lyman. Um, um, of Mugar. Thanks, Chair. My um, when we first brought this up, I think uh, we got into a discussion about retention and that how the public and others might want to access this data. The policy says 30 days. We discussed previously that's not a lot of time. Maybe a suggestion I would make would be perhaps the EPD website could could have a, a statement about we maintain these cameras. The data is maintained for 30 days. If you re recite the policy because a lawyer, some when an event happens, you know, like a, it could be, be for a traffic incident, a, a pedestrian traffic thing. It could it could be for many reasons that legally these images could be helpful to the public, and they're they're there. But thirty days is a really short time frame, and I'm not suggesting if that's the technology and they're overwritten, that's consistent and fair. It's just I think there ought to be some notice to the public that it exists, and if you have a legal need for it. Um, you need to act quickly and notify the manager or someone, you know, just some mechanism where there's informed to the public that it exists and you could get it if you have a legal right to get it. That's what that we get that. Yep. Okay, Commissioner um, Lemons. Your hand was up. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually really appreciate Commissioner Lehman, Judge Lehman, um, for bringing that up. That's one of my biggest concerns is, is like, you know, I, if EPD can access it, the public should have access to. Um, 
I have other questions and other comments that I want to, but I want to make a motion right now that um, we, ex we we put it into the policy that the retention is 90 days instead of 30 days to give the public and their lawyers more access. Okay. It might not go anywhere, but I'm making the motion. It, it could be a technological issue. That's my only issue with that. I don't know, like a cockpit voice recorder. That's a current debate going on in the aviation world. They only record for 30 minutes and people think it should be two hours. I don't know that these systems, like that maybe the disk drive or something, I, I support what you're saying, but maybe we ought to hear about whether it can actually do it. Yeah, I would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would I would feel more comfortable voting on that after it got to the police chief, as well as those folks who basically explain to us what we can and cannot do. And at that point, it, it might not be an issue whatsoever to, to do that motion. I'm not comfortable voting. On that one, I don't even understand. Well, that deputy, can, can, we, can we just put that to the table? Can we table that to our next meeting? I'm down the table, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Hawkins. Oh, no, um, I'm sorry. Oh, I, oh yes, I, I'm sorry. Just wanted to make that motion, but I have other uh questions. Um, yeah. so and and as you can tell, like the entire commission is confused about like which is private, public, and all of that stuff. Um but I, I have a very specific question. So like, can EPD access the parks cameras? Can they access the garage cameras? You know, what do you, when you're talking about what's the term access, can we make a phone call and say parks, um, the parking control, can we please get a copy of this footage for this time frame? That answer is yes. Okay. Do we okay. have to do the same thing for the parks camera? Can we have access or can you make a record, you know, copy of the footage? No, thank you. Um, and can the public do the same? I'm not sure what their policy is on on uh, for their camera system. I'm not sure if they have a policy or um or what it says. The different because it's a different division from us. Yeah, no, the city's so siloed. Um, so that that's something I'll be bringing up later. Um, and then um, I know I asked ra like rapid succession questions, but there was two that weren't answered. So I'm just gonna go one by one. Um, and uh, to Judge Lehman's point, like, so how do private parties request this? What is the process? How how can they get access to these cameras? I think if you look at um, section 1210.8.1, it says public and any other agency requests on, and it, it talks about the process to go about getting the footage. It, 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 it does, and then it says it is up to the chief's discretion. And that's what concerns me the most is like, what, what you know, like um, what qualifiers or, or what, you know, um, check boxes does it make to where he is willing to share it and when he's not? And I would much prefer it to be in policy than within one person's hands to do so. Um, so I'm not making a motion about that. Yeah, I'm that. really sorry, but I don't see where it says that the chief's discretion. Oh, I can. That's for the one above it. I can pull it up. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't so print 12, it. 10, 12, 10, 8, 21 does say that it, the city attorney processes it and gives the final say so for a public request for uh, if a subpoena or court order um so it if it may at best be ambiguous you know the responsibility is shared but it would seem it seems like if someone makes a request it goes to the city attorney's office um but the, but the second paragraph is dealing with the public records law about if there's an ongoing investigation and the media asks for it, then the policy of EPD is not to release the footage. But but one is under a court process and the other would be. And I'm not I'm not pushing back or defending or stating that I know what the policy is. I'm just reading the the first one clearly contemplates the city attorney making the decision of. Um, release when it's a subpoena or a court order or something of that nature. No, I appreciate that, and uh, honestly, I'm I'm looking for it. I I I didn't print it out today, but uh, I, in the last policy, I, I know that there was a chief's discretion thing, and that concerned me. So if if that's still uh, sorry, it's, it's just twelve ten point five. Oh, what? Why don't, why don't we stick to the hands that are up? 
Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'll keep going. Before we do that, so let's let's, um, let's continue with Commissioner Lemon. Then yes. we have Vice Chair Hawkins, and then we have Commissioner Ship. Thank you. And yeah, the the, the last question, and you know, uh, Commissioner Booker has, has, has touched on this as well. But um, how do you measure the success of the Guardian trailers? What objective measures do you use? Yeah, well, I mean, Guardian trailers are mostly put out as a deterrent to crime. So you can look at, and we can look at statistics and see the rise and fall of crime in a specific area. Do we do that? No, we're not. So we are looking at crimes heading into an area for, for deployment of the trailers. We deploy them. Uh, we hope that we're accomplishing a mission by deterring. We're using it to gather uh, criminal intelligence that we can solve crimes with. Um, and, and really, theoretically, we could go back and we could look at and say, how many crimes did we solve in this area with the help of the Guardian trailer? Uh, Commissioner, I got to tell you, that's that's just a tremendous, tremendous load for us to try to go back and uh, replicate all that data, particularly in light of the data systems that we have in place. So, and I'm really not, not asking. I'm, not you, I'm really not asking you to go back because I know that's a huge project, but I I think that might be something that you can do in the moment and going forward. Just a suggestion, and I'm I'm going to lower my hand. Thank you, Vice Chair Hawkins. Thanks, Chair. I'm wondering if it's possible to hear from Commissioner Mogart uh, his reason for the no vote on the amendment to on the proposed amendment to the policy. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, um, I I hear Commissioner Dominguez and I hear her saying that she's confused about the situation, and then I don't hear her have the option of being able to explain her confusion. And then the rest of the motion is just sort of rushed through. Um, I'm quite confused about the, the motion as well. I'm quite confused about where we are with it. I think that in any discussion that we've had, the chief has said flat that there will be no facial recognition used from the cameras that are being uh, currently used, that are currently in use. And if we have that discussion that we start introducing facial recognition as a commission, um, when that was something that the chief said that wouldn't happen. Um, I have a real issue with that because the facial recognition issue has always been the reason why I've had concerns about the police cameras. Um, so that's that's why I voted no. And thank you for giving me that, that opportunity. Mr. Shivers? Um, yeah, uh, so uh, for... Uh, just to address what Silver just said, I think I think we're all in agreement, and Bonnie's motion was just to codify that in in policy, so that if um, basically in the future, if somebody wants to change it, it takes more uh, going through more policies to effectively effectively change it. Um, as far as uh, the access to the recordings and the sort of freedom of, um, freedom of information aspect and the 90 day recording period. Um, I don't have strong answers. Chief will have better ones. I do remember that the last time we had the conversation, the 90 day discussion um, or longer um, revolved around the the cost of uh, maintaining the data and um, the sheer, and that's not just like cost in server space, but also the cost in um, labor. It takes a lot of a lot of work to keep the the servers running, to keep the data working, to keep it searchable, um, and uh, it's something for us to consider before we hear back from Chief. Is the tripling of the work output in in the um, on the on the data side of it, as far as the public access concerns, um, I also because I've seen the the cameras, um, particularly in other states, uh, particularly traffic cameras, where I could go on right now to cameras in Florida and watch intersections if I really wanted to. Um, last time we discussed that, the issue I believe the one that stuck with me anyway was the. Uh, ability of that to be abused, particularly in our smaller town. When we're talking about an intersection, it's it's whatever. But um, here, it's going to necessarily include 
storefronts and the ability of um, uh, stalkers to freely access that information is something we want to avoid. So I agree, we don't, um, we don't necessarily need to put all of this work on Chief's lap, but I believe if any freedom of information requests come through, that goes through the city attorney anyway. Um, those are my two thoughts. I don't have any answers, but um, uh, that's what I remember from last time we had these discussions. Okay, we're gonna to go to, we have one more question, and then we're gonna go into our um, next uh, speaker, um, Commissioner um, Dominguez. Sorry, I've got two things. Um, I'm not sure how important it is. Okay, I will go with what um, um, Commissioner Mogart was saying. Um, that actually makes a lot of sense. And now I see that, thank you for saying that. Um, so can we make a motion to have, to propose like the simplest possible policy, because apparently we can have policies that are very, very short according to the mutual aid policy. Um, can we have a policy that just on its own says no facial recognition software? So it's not just the chief that said it because one day he may or may not leave. Um, you know, one that actually just says no facial recognition software until further notice or whatever. Is that a motion? Yes. Second. Thank you. So just to be clear, what you're you're asking to chief to you're recommending to the chief that he adopt this policy. Yes, since he said it also, like why don't we just have it as a policy? Right. I, no, that, that was great. Thank you, um, Commissioner Dominguez. And also Commissioner Mogart. And Commissioner and... Mogart. For all those in favor of Commissioner Dominguez, Commissioner Mogart's motion, raise your hand. By saying aye. Aye. Those um, two, two things. Point of order. We need to have a discussion before we yeah. vote. Yeah. Okay. Before and we two. Vote. Um, do we not already have that in our emergent technologies policy? That I don't know, but it'll be a, it'll be a rerun. So then we have we have it twice. Can yeah, we yes. yeah, yeah, just, I'm just uncomfortable with the idea that uh, it's a huge topic. I'm completely supportive of a ban of the use of facial recognition. I didn't hear the chief say it. I thought what we did this evening on this specific policy was make it really clear that these cameras are, that it's prohibited. And if we want to do a policy that you're suggesting, Commissioner Dominguez, I'm totally on board for it, but I would want it presented and I'd like to hear you know, that, and if it's a simple no-brainer because the police are going to confirm that we don't use it and we don't want to use it, then it would be a brief item. But without that without that context, um, to just quickly do such a big, important topic, even though I support it, I, I won't support the motion. Okay, Commissioner Mogart? Your hand was up. Thank you. Yeah, here, I'm, I'm, I'm it's the technology here. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Now I can see myself. Um, so, Commissioner Lehman, this is where institutional and historic knowledge comes into play. Um, I was there when we had this, these original discussions about the cameras, and the commission was clear that they did not want to have any facial recognition taking part in any of the, the cameras that were going to be implemented. Um, it was a concern of mine. It was a concern for, uh, of, of most of the, the commissioners at the time. So, that's um, that's the first thing. And um, two, an, another part of the ad hoc committee that we don't even discuss anymore was uh, the the conversation around the use of um, these new technology pieces that could be implemented and uh, the concerns that the ad hoc committee and people from the community had regarding these um, new pieces of technology. and um, you know, from our conversations with the chief at the time, uh, directly after the ad hoc committee had met, um, it, it, it was, um, shared with us that the, the police department was going to take each and every new technology piece on a, uh, one, one by one basis. So as they come forward that we wouldn't be using or implementing, uh, stinger 
operating devices, which is where a, a vehicle will drive down the street and just swipe every single uh, license plate that's been passed and check on the, the, validity, the, the validity of those license plates. And if anybody is attached to it that has a warrant and just all kinds of different things um, that the um, stoplights would not have video cameras operating. So these are these are things that were discussed at length, um, not just during the ad hoc committee, but at the police department, the police commission um, in the past. So that's all I'll say about it. So B, repeat the motion. Chair. Yeah. Hey. When I asked my question to Bonnie, I was actually trying to have, have her reframe it so that the motion is have the chief investigate bringing back a policy about facial recognition, but not having facial recognition, as opposed to us just saying that's the policy and yes, no chief. Because I agree with what Alan and other people have said this merits more conversation or not, depending on what the chief says. I do not disagree with that, especially given what um, Commissioner Mogart just said about uh, Stinger technology, which I hadn't heard of. Um, clearly my facial recognition policy would not cover that. I didn't even say that, um, but I would love for that to be included as well. Um, how do we, how do we get, how do we officially get the chief to hopefully address this and help us with a policy that would actually address it in, in well, concrete. Well, what we, what we would need to do, A, the chief would need to be here. Okay. Two, we, need to, we all need to be more prepared about the subject matter. Hence, the next meeting, if y'all would like, we can, one of the things I do, one of the benefits of being the chair is, is we put things on the agenda. And you know, this as being a former vice chair. So if you would like us to put this on the agenda, so we can fine tune the information that we're talking about. I'm I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. We can table this now, and we can bring that back when we're a little bit more prepared. And also, the chief is a little bit more prepared to answer our question. And then, and then I also value y'all put the ad hoc committee, which um, Commissioner Mogart alluded to, did a lot of work. Let's look and see what we have. Why 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 can't we not? So I would love to have. Commissioner Mogart inform us a little bit more about what the ad hoc committee was talking about. Then um, the chief, knowing that this is what we're talking about, what, you're, what we're trying to propose, if he's all for these things, then let's put it on. What you want to see is that these things put on writing. And that's where yes. I, I, I'm kind of understand. And, and I have no problem with that at all. So, but I'm saying that we're not going to be able to vote on it to be put on writing right now because we do not have sufficient information. Therefore, I'm going to table it. That sounds good. I think that that's a really good plan. And um, are you tabling it so that um, Commissioner Moger can inform us next time? Or are you asking us to do that kind of on this? Uh, as an no, no, no. We're going to bring this information will be brought to the chief. And then and then prior, I, you know, I can get with Commissioner Mogart. He can kind of give us a little bit more details, you know, um, as far as what the ad hoc committee was talking about. Maybe we can bridge these things together. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Over. Uh, yeah. So one of the reasons why we have this policy where we retain the information, the, the, the tape was um, it was it was uh, around the same situation with the, the facial recognition, the drone policy that was being implemented at the time and the 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 cameras. Uh, they retain the tape so that you can they can go back and look at that information. Um, the the fact that facial recognition technology at that point was still um, being implemented, you know, mostly by China as a way to use it as a um, societal sort of <laughs> reward or um, punishment, you know, um, yeah. that stuff, that kind of stuff wasn't really at the forefront of technology at the, at that time. But there was discussion around it because that was something that was taking place. There were facial recognition cam cameras that were available and that were being discussed. So um, one of the, I don't know what it's called, when you, I'm going to give you this, you give me that. Um, my brain's blank on that right now, but 
one of the reasons why we had the the policy where we have the retention of the the cameras, the footage, was because of that uh, conversation regarding facial recognition. And I can't remember the dates of those specific conversations, but that's what took place. I see. I see the hands. I, I see the hands that are up. I'm going to say reserve that for um, your your closing comment, and that's a question or answer. We need to move on to the next speaker. Um, next speaker. Here. Robert's rules, you can't technically um, table a motion, but you can ask that the motion be withdrawn. And okay. Defer um, okay. I would like to defer my motion until the next meeting. All those in favor? Raise okay, your you hand. Don't have on that. And, I, and I, we're going to put that on the agenda, um, Commissioner Demir, So Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely address that. Um, our next subject matter on our agenda, we need to move on, is recruitment, retention, and promotional development, DEI. We have Sergeant Kara Williams, who will be doing a presentation. She's here with us right now. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Now, folks watching on Zoom, as you know, in the past when we've had presentations, sometimes it crashes. So just bear with us here as we work through this. So hold, hold on a moment. So. Um, I'll go over the first few slides while Holly is getting that up and running. I'm Sergeant Kara Williams. Uh, I am currently assigned to the Finance and Administration Division of the Eugene Police Department. I've been a police officer with the City of Eugene for 22 years. Um, in that time, uh, roughly 19 years was spent uh, working as a patrol officer uh, until I was uh, selected during a hiring process for a full-time recruitment officer position. Uh, that was a new assignment in 2020 that was created with CSI or CES PT funds. Um, a month after I started that position, COVID hit. Um, so recruitment came uh, pretty much to a stop during that time. Um, but in 2021, I was assigned as an acting and capacity sergeant uh, in the role of hiring and backgrounds. And in 2023, I was promoted to a sergeant and tested and am in my current role. Um, in my current assignment, I oversee the recruitment team, our hiring team, the background investigations team, uh, or I am the ERC liaison, uh, for hiring. I'm also the fitness manager for the Eugene Police Department. I am the Special Olympics coordinator, the safety committee chair, and I oversee all the LEMLA claims uh, and am the liaison for that, which is uh, Law Enforcement Medical um, Association. I'm also the backup lieutenant for facilities and fleet in the spare time. That's okay. So going over recruitment uh, with the Eugene Police Department, primarily um, my office function is recruitment for police officers. I do assist other units with their hiring, um, including our CSOs, our animal welfare, our CET members, our records division, our administrative staff, and 911. Um, my unit in recruitment consists of one sergeant, myself, and 11 team members. Those team members have anywhere from 22 years of experience to two years experience. Uh, they're both entry and lateral officers. 
They have military experience, bilingual, diversity and special teams experience, including field training officers, motors, drones, SWAT, honor guard, and peer support, and an EVOC member, our emergency vehicle operations. Um, this team is double the size of any historic EPD recruitment team. This is new to EPD, um, and we're trying to grow in size. The position for recruitment team is open to any sworn officer. They apply, they go through a testing process and a performance evaluation, and the successful candidates are then selected for the team. And we have one full-time recruitment officer um, and that is funded by uh, CSPT funding. It's not working. I'm sorry. Kara. Okay. Well, I'm super bummed in the PowerPoint. Um, oh. Oh. oh, there it is. Can people at home see that? I can't. Can you? You can't. Yes, okay. All right. Can. Hang yeah, on. It's not for okay. us. It's, it's opening, but just a second. We'll get there. Can you see that now? Yes. I think I'm on sequence. the first one with photo. Yeah. Uh, one more. If you want to go to the full screen, hold on. This is this is where we've had it's problems. Little, it's up on the red toolbar and it has a little play area. Yes. Sorry, thank you. Okay, can people see that at home? Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're still seeing speaker mode. mode, by the way. And we're also seeing, um, what we're seeing is the Microsoft, like the whole page, like as if we were editing it. Is that what you want us to be seeing? That's fine. Okay. Um, so our full-time recruitment officer is Officer Jennifer Peckles. Um, and that is a CSPT funded position. And then we have Detective Rick Lowe, myself, Detective Ryan Underwood. I apologize. So just real quickly, um, can you double click on it or something? Cause it's on the first page. It's still on the first page. Yes. I think it's projecting to the TV in the room, but not to the Zoom. Okay. Sorry, everybody. We'll get there. I mean, I'm following along pretty well without the images, but you're doing okay. a good job. Okay. Maybe we'll just go ahead and Okay. Um, and then we have Officer Trent Magnuson, Officer Brooke Popatrick, Detective Glenn Gilhuber, Officer Ty Meyer, Officer Eugene Henderson, Officer Caleb Goldsby, Officer Lauren Nesser, and Officer Jose Perez. And although um, we do have a dedicated recruitment team, every employee at EPD is considered a recruiter. All of our staff, uh, whether they're on recruitment team or not, participate in our outreach, um, all of our events, our social media, our digital marketing, advertising, and uh, several uh, people, including 911 and records, participate in our ride along program. Several, several of our recruitment team members uh, also participate in our hiring process. They act as ORPAT, the physical agility test for police officer testing. They're instructors. They proctor the written tests for police officers. They act as role players during our scenario. They sit on our interview panel. And I believe now half of them are background investigators. So our team follows our candidates from the time we recruit them all the way through training. And then we also ask that those recruiters stay as mentors to each of the employees throughout their career. Um, our background investigators, because I oversee that team, they know each of our candidates um, when they onboard as employees better than anyone. 
um, better than anyone that saw them during testing or anyone that met them throughout the process. And so I have unofficially asked our background investigators to act as mentors to our new employees. And so whenever an issue comes up, um, if they're struggling with training or they have a personal or professional issue, I reach out to the background investigator to have contact with them as uh, our mentorship program. Historical differences in our recruiting style. Um, until about 2010, police officers weren't recruited. I got hired, well, I was uh, recruited in 2001. I was hired here in 2002 and nobody recruited back then. We were part of hundreds and thousands of applicants who were fighting for one or two job positions in the agencies. And so we had to out test and outshine hundreds of people. And so recruiting really didn't happen um, back then. And it was an unsaid rule that you would apply with lots of agencies because you likely weren't gonna get that one or two spots that one agency had. And now that's very different. We have lots of positions open nationwide and fewer applicants. And so we're all fighting for the same great candidates. Um, another thing is that the job dimensions are a little bit different and a little difficult for our newer generations. Um, police work is one of those jobs where human nature and communication skills, interpersonal skills are a prime. That's all we do. And we're trying to recruit a younger generation who hasn't really had as much exposure with those interpersonal skills. They have, when I started, we didn't have cell phones. Uh, Facebook had just started. We didn't have social media. And so they are just a different type of officer that we're trying to recruit. And so old methods don't really work um, for these newer generations. Um, additionally, career longevity. Um, a, a, being a police officer is has typically and historically been something that you spend 20 to 30 years doing. And now the newer generations are looking at a police career that's between five and 12 years long. So those are just a few of the differences um, that we're struggling with uh, currently. There's also been a change in culture and generations. So that means a change in our recruitment efforts. Um, not to say that it doesn't happen because EPD has a few success stories, um, but historically a career in policing was shared through generations. So it was um, very common to have your son or daughter or a niece or nephew follow in your footsteps to become a police officer. And now that has is rarely the case. Um, also, printed flyers were the primary marketing tool, um, but nobody really does paper um, anymore. So pictures and video are our strongest recruitment tools outside of interactions with our actual police officers. Um, most of our current applicants say that they either saw one of our current videos, heard a radio ad, or a friend, family member, or themselves had a positive interaction with the Eugene police officer, and that's why they applied. Um, our recruitment struggles are not unique to Eugene. Nationwide, all agencies are uh, struggling to fill vacancies. And like I said before, we're all fighting for those same great candidates. So really selling what the Eugene Police Department has to offer and the city of Eugene is key for us. Um, the requirements in the last several decades have also changed to become a police officer. Uh, when I was hired, well, before I was hired, you had to be a certain height and weight uh, to be a police officer. And when I got hired, you had to have a college education. It was uh, mandatory. And then shortly after, they moved away from college requirements to related work experience. So you had to work in social work or security or military. And now our current requirements align with the state requirements with DPSST and also industry standards. And that is to attract the largest applicant pool. 
And I'll talk a little bit more about that during the hiring section. Trends we've seen in our recruitment methods, um, a large portion of our applicants uh, land in one of these areas. They're either laterals, they came from our cadet program or another agency's cadet program, college graduates, and not just criminal justice programs. We're seeing applicants who went to school for nursing, um, physiology, teaching, psychology, anthropology, history, and because of some interaction they had or job markets, they've chosen to apply for one of our spots. Um, college athletes, and that's a lot to do with the uh, team aspects of police work. Trade schools, we see a lot of people who um, went into trades specifically with cars or some type of construction, and they are now looking for police jobs and mainly because of the longer career and benefits. Uh, we're still seeing a large uh, majority of our applicants coming from military and security companies. So our methods moved from paper. Uh, we did the flyers and the brochures. Uh, we still do those uh, in print um, for some of our recruitments, but mostly uh, we're moving to our market and that's the younger generation. So website-based, social media, QR codes, digital marketing, radio and television. Uh, when I came into this position as a recruitment officer, uh, we changed the website from the epdjobs.com and removed all of those um, brandings from the patrol vehicles. There might be one or two still out there, the older models, yeah, like uh, officer testers, school resource car. We're, we're removing those and we're going to the eugenepolice.com um, we also have created a QR code so that people can go to our website with their cell phones. Um, we've also started posting all of our advertisements on YouTube, and we are currently creating our own podcast. Uh, with CSI or CSPT funds, we purchase new recruitment booths, uh, both for police 911 in our cadet program. Um, I have been told at the last years of booths that we have the flashiest booth that anybody sees at these police and military recruitment sites. And that's what gets people to come chat with our recruiters over someone else's. Um, we still do the flyers and posters, mainly, mainly for our college outreach. And then any special events, we send them to military bases um, when they're outsourcing um, and work source um, offices and then unemployment offices. Um, we started hosting career nights. Um, our next one, I believe is Saturday, January 27th. Um, and that will be here in the Kilcullen rooms and that will be open to the public. We haven't done those in a few years because of COVID, but we're opening that back up. We also have a recruitment card and that has all of our contact resources on it. And the recruitment team has been spending the last year helping our cadet program um, add the number of um, cadets that we can enter in the program and the number of cadet advisors. So we're trying to build that program. So the three things in the last three years that we've been working really hard on and we've seen um, the most improvement in our recruitment from, from are the CSI or CSPT funds. Um, we were able to hire an independent media photographer production company and they produced all of our uh, videos, the photographs, um, and we were so successful with that that he just got hired and he's being sworn in tomorrow. <laughs> so um, everything that he's done and how much he's worked with our agency is really coming through. Um, we also went before the city senior IT web team and we were approved to upgrade a recruitment website um, that would not look like the rest of the city websites. And this is a pilot project and we will be launching that uh, at the beginning of this year. This website will feature all of the new videos that we created and photographs. It will be accessible by phone and any electronic platform. 
It will also uh, feature careers in police, 911, and cadets for the pilot program. Our hope is that we're successful and then we can put all um, of the EPD job openings on the recruitment site. Our website will include content, including items that inform an applicant or an interested person, or even just a public member about our department, about the city of Eugene, um, about becoming a police officer, what we do, what the job duties entail, and an entire outline of training from start until the release of probation. It will outline our hiring process, what the requirements are through the state and through the um, department and any disqualifiers. And it will break down each step of the testing process and tips and tricks that people can do in order to prepare for the process. It'll tell an applicant how to apply. And there's frequently asked questions, um, anything about uniform to um, whether or not our policies allow you to have tattoos. Uh, we have taken every question that we've gotten over the last few years and added an answer for our applicants in that area. Um, it'll have a list of documents needed in the hiring process so they can prepare those. Sometimes they're time sensitive and it takes a little while for our applicants to get those. There'll be a contact a recruiter um, application and links to our ride along program. And we, hope to add pathways to promotion so people can see um, how to join a special team or how to promote through the rank um, here at EPD. In 2021, we changed our motto from come join our team to come serve with us. Chief Skinner's motto since he came here has been about service. And on every semi-truck going down I-5, all I saw was join our team, join our team. So we wanted to stand out different and speak to people a little bit more about the work that we do. And so come serve with us, uh, fit uh, what our goal was better. And so that is our official motto. Um, there is, was a short little video. Um, in 2022, we partnered, um, Jose was not a member of the recruitment team at the time. Um, but like I said, every employee is a recruiter. And so he partnered with us to do a uh, podcast and uh, it was for Spanish speaking. And we got great reviews um, about that. And so he spoke about a police career and how to apply as a police officer. And you can click part of it or... I don't this is the next. So in 2023, um, we started pushing out recruitment videos um, in order for people to see the faces of the officers doing the work here at EPD and to understand a little bit about the job and reasons that we applied and the things that keep us coming to work every day. And this is just a sample of our most recent video. For everyday people that are doing a job that not everybody does. I just kind of fell in love with law enforcement, showing up to work every day, serving my community, and feeling like I make a difference. This is exactly what I want to be. This is exactly who I want to be. You don't get this in any regular job. This is this is special. Other jobs you can get kind of complacent, and I feel like this career path should always be better. I definitely couldn't see myself doing it. I think it's the best job in the world. It's so rewarding. It gives you an opportunity to be out in the community, help people. It's a really good feeling in your ship to go home and be proud and satisfied with the work you did. There's jobs and there's careers and then there's passions. I can only count a handful of times where I truly felt like I'm actually working. The majority of the time, I can't believe that I actually get to do this job. It's a lot more than what I used to get in the action movies. What really drew me in was getting to see officers interact with the public on right alongs, see the difference that they can make in people's lives and in times of crisis. It's easy to remind yourself why you're there. The reason that somebody called is because they can help. Being able to offer empathy and support and 
resources in that situation. Make other people's lives easier and hold people accountable, then it's easy to help accountable. It's challenging, certainly. Life's complicated. People's issues are complicated. We look for people who are capable to deal with conflict and solve problems. We spend a lot of time my training, and I think that shows in the officers' attitudes and mannerisms, force, and how we interact. Definitely separate us as a brother agency. I'm proud of the work that I see your DPD officer doing every day. Most of the community is very supportive of law enforcement. It's not our fault to be on a call and have somebody thank us for what we do. Policing is different since three years ago, and Eugene's at the cutting edge of what police should be. We're challenged every day. It's our responsibility to rise to those challenges. There's an expectation that the person that's going to show up from the police department is a person of good character. There's probably other things that I could be doing that would be a lot safer, make more money. But then a day for me, this isn't something that I do for the paycheck. The reality is, as well, individual people with different experiences that have brought us to where we are today. There's so many different walks of life. Officers you would never think are cops, and then it's game time. They put on the uniform and the gear, and they go after it. Our department is a family. We're a team. I know that the people that I work with are invested in seeing me succeed. There is a really strong support group internally. It's a pretty special thing that I'm grateful to be a part of. Police work in general is what you think of it. You're here for the excitement and want to stay busy, you'll find it. If we can get people interested in this job, then we need it. Go for a ride along. See what it's like and yeah, apply. Do it 100 percent because it's the greatest career in the world. If you feel like there's more of you that you can give to others and that's your passion, this is the right job for you. Regret creeps into people's minds a lot. And if you think that 10 years from now you would regret not trying, I would say do it. Mm -hmm. Another oh, sorry. <laughs> Another resource we have is an online submittal form on our website. When an applicant or someone interested uh, wants to speak with a recruiter, um, they can click that and it generates an email to the recruitment team and we make contact within 48 hours. Um, also, all of our branding goes straight to my desk number at work. So I get all of the recruitment contacts and we, one of our recruiters will contact anyone within 48 hours. Hi, I'm Chris Karen, Chief oh of God. Police for the Where is that coming from? <laughs> That's part of it. Is that okay? The ideal candidate is somebody who can problem solve, think creatively and have compassion for the struggles that we see in our community. Find us at eugenepolice.com or search the City of Eugene Current Job Postings for our application. Come serve with us. So that was our most recent radio ad. Um, we have been paying for broadcasting in larger areas, including Los Angeles, Seattle, the Portland metro area, um, Coos Bay, and all of Lane County. Our social media posts are also boosted with certain terms and locations in order to target certain areas um, or interested applicants. So we try to hit like all the call big colleges um, in those areas uh, right before graduation. Um, and we were trying to kind of push our ads um, around graduation times in California because Applicants down in California put themselves through training and then seek employment when in academy. And so we boosted our ads uh, around those areas so those applicants would come with some experience and apply with us. We've also paid for geofencing and that was paid for with CSI, CPSC funds. Um, so we can track who's looking at our information and if they arrive to headquarters and if they have applied. We paid, we paid to place TV ads um, on local networks during peak times, including the Olympics and World Games and March Madness. And uh, we do media print ads in Minority Report, Register Guard, and the Oregonian for all of our internal and external postings. And then I could only put a couple dozen of our web-based and online platforms 
but we do post uh, all of our hiring processes on these platforms as well. And then these are just a few of the great faces um, that I've had the pleasure of hiring in the last three years. Um, and I'm happy to say that a couple of them have even joined our recruitment team because they just absolutely love the fact um, that they got recruited by one of us and they want to be that person for the next incoming person. Um, hiring. The Eugene Police Department's hiring motto is that we hire for attitude and character and we train for skill. We do not require any applicant applying for a police job to come in with previous training um, and we don't do any scenario based um, questions um, or role plays that were, would require them to have some previous knowledge in police work. The hiring interview questions are based off of the Hiring for Attitude book by Mark Murphy and we're looking for coachability skills, emotional intelligence, um, and technical competence. Um, to name a few, but again, it's that not that they have any police knowledge or they know what to do during a specific scenario. We can train them for that, but we really do want people with positive attitudes who have experienced some adversity in their life, who um, bring some other experience because what we do is work with humans and everybody's different. So we want them to have a really diverse background. Our hiring process is open continuously. Uh, we closed our process last night, I believe at five, and we opened one today. Uh, we have a testing process this weekend. So we never have to tell an applicant that's interested, you have to wait for our next posting. We are always open. Um, our testing process lasts 90 days. So from the time they walk in the door for the first testing day until the day they walk in the door for their first day of work is approximately 90 days. All of our application process is done online through NeoGov. Um, the steps in our process include the application and a score for minimum qualifications. Then they come in on a Saturday for our physical agility test and a writing exam. The following three days are in-person interviews. And if candidates are successful, they move on to a background investigation and then are invited to a chief's interview. At the chief's interview, that's when they're given their conditional offer of hire. And then a psychological and a medical exam are scheduled. And upon the completion of those, a final offer is given. Minimum qualifications um, are pre-screened by our ERC division. ERC, looks over each application and they determine who meets the minimum qualifications. Those qualifications include being 21 years of age at the date of hire, a high school or GED uh, diploma, no felonies. And we just changed this to two years of work experience. We had three years, uh, but we now have two years of work experience um, or military or college. And can you explain what ERC stands for? Oh, uh, ERC is the Employee Resource Center. It's our human resource center uh, here in Eugene. Um, our testing occurs on Saturday. Um, that's when they do the ORPAT testing and the writing exam. And then the interviews happen Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Uh, we do pay for practice tests for the writing exam. That's new. Um, and we send them a link so that they can practice those tests before they come in at no charge. And they're also invited to a practice session uh, for the physical agility test, which is called the ORPAT test. The writing tests, again, I said they were on Saturday, um, are out of state applicants. We hold the testing process the way we do so that out of state applicants only have to travel to Eugene one time during our hiring process. And that is for the writing exam, the physical agility test, and then they get first come first serve for interviews Sunday morning so that they can travel back home. Um, they arrive to the test. It's held here in the Kilcullen room. It's a timed two hour test. 
Um, the test is required. A form of it, this test is um, required by the state through the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training. Um, areas of the test include observation, memory, written communication, reading comprehension, and analytical abilities. Um, ERC and the recruitment staff um, are able to give them their scores right away. Um, it generates to our laptops. We can show them a breakdown of how they did in each of the four components of the testing. And if they get a passing score, we give them the directions and location to the physical agility test, which happens approximately an hour after their written exam. At the physical agility test, um, applicants arrive, the instructors and recruiters at the location, um, explain the test, they walk the whole group through the test um, and what the expectations are. Applicants are asked to pass this test in five minutes and 16 seconds. Chief Skinner has um, allowed us to have our applicants pass this test at a slower time than is required at the state level um, for DPSST. Once they're hired and they go to the State Academy for training, they will be required to pass the test at the faster time. But for hiring purposes, we have um, added, I believe it's like 31 seconds. Yeah, um, for testing. Um, if the applicant passes the physical agility test, our recruitment officer, uh, Jen Peckles, she signs them up for their interview times the following days. The interviews take place, again, here in the Coquillon room. Um, the applicant is given a short scenario description uh, before they enter the testing room. And the scenarios just require them to mediate a situation with a citizen. We wanna see what their verbal skills are like and their interpersonal skills and how they can handle a little bit of conflict. After completing the short role play, they do do an interview. It's typically about 30 minutes long where they're asked 10 to 12 questions that are character-based. The panel is trained by myself and our employee resource center um, in hiring good hiring practices and things to be aware of um, when grading the applicants and their answers. Um, our current police officer hiring panel does include a community impact panel member for police officers. If they're successful in the interview process, um, they are moved to background. At the conclusion of the interview, we ask the applicants to fill out a pre-employment records check if they make it to the background phase, that is the first time that a records check is completed on any applicant. Um, our Employee Resource Center sends the candidates by email their personal history statements and their personal history questionnaires um, and walks them through that process. Both of these forms are required by the state through the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training. And I've added the O. OAR for you. Um, they just updated this and we're currently updating both of those forms to make sure that we fulfill those requirements. We were one of the agencies that they looked at um, as being the lead in background investigations and used our model in order to create theirs. Um, so if you do go to their website and look up that OAR, you can find the requirements um, statewide of what we're supposed to ask. Um, and how we're supposed to conduct the background investigation. Uh, Eugene Police is uh, fairly unique um, in that we travel for all of our police officer background investigations. Um, sometimes when our applicants learn this, um, they withdraw from process. We are one of the only agencies that travel to where the applicant has um, been born, raised, has work experience, school experience. Um, we make in-person contacts. We don't rely on using mailers, email, or just phone interviews for those contacts. And all of our interviews with our applicants are recorded. Um, and these are some of the DPSST requirements again. And this is for any uh, certified position. We have some 
non-certified positions at Eugene Police that don't have the same level of background um, that our certified positions do. And then polygraph is not legal in Oregon, so we don't do polygraph uh, for hiring. Uh, and we don't collect information if they have a polygraph from another agency. Um, our background investigations are confidential. They're not releasable to the candidate, and we don't give uh, details to the candidate about why they may have not been successful in the background investigation. Um, and background investigations for certified positions are always open. So just because you got hired doesn't mean your background is closed. If we do find something out later um, that was omitted or um, was not discovered at the time of your uh, initial employment, we can uh, open that investigation back up. At the conclusion of the background investigation, uh, the chief um, and deputy chief, the hiring supervisors and our employee resource center debrief each candidate's background and those that pass are invited to a chief's interview. Mm -hmm. The chief conducts an interview at um, another scheduled date and he um, will decide who gets a conditional offer of employment. When they receive that conditional offer, our employee resource center schedules the medical exams and the psychological evaluations. Once they've completed the psych and medical, a full offer employment is sent to the candidate. Our candidates are provided um, more than two weeks notice so that they can give appropriate notice to their current employers. And then um, again, our onboarding is approximately 90 days um, from the start of the process to the conclusion. A little bit about retention. Um, we hire an average of 20 to 25 officers a year. Um, with retirements, attrition, and career departures, we're able to fill those general fund open positions um, with heavy recruitment efforts. Um, but anything over that is still um, a struggle for us. Um, DPSST has also limited the number of openings uh, for state required training. So when I got hired, uh, I was hired with a team, uh, with a group of, I believe we started with 19 and we all went to academy at the same time. And now DPSST cannot take all the agencies across the state with 19 at a time. So we're We've been sending five to 10, but that's about our hiring pool. We're, we're offering in each of our processes um, about between five and 10, sometimes a little more um, offers at a time. The difference also is that when I was hired, there was only one, maybe two academy classes a year. And now we have five to six hiring processes a year. So we're still hiring the same number of officers that we were before. Um, it's just how we're getting there is a little bit different. Um, I already talked a little bit about career commitments um, with the younger generation. And then also the climate of law enforcement has kind of removed some of our officers that started here and has deterred some candidates for safer occupations, lifestyles, and areas to live in. Our recruitment team is dedicated to retaining um, officers and, and all employees department-wide. Um, that's why we mentor our new hires. Um, our team meets uh, at least once monthly, if not more, and we bring any concerns that our work units uh, bring forward to command. We conducted a department survey and we've revisited that uh, twice since we conducted it to see if we're meeting the needs of the employees at EPD. Um, in one of the first meetings uh, with employees, um, it was brought to our attention that fitness, wellness, and workout time was a number one priority for our staff. And so the recruitment team purchased equipment, designed the layout, did all the labor and cleaning, and put together the proposal for on paid on-duty paid workout time um, to the Eugene Police Department. And so now we have a brand new workout facility here at EPD um, based off of that survey and employee feedback. 
Um, the recruitment team also brought in yoga and mindfulness classes um, for all employees. And we're also offering employee opportunities, including training and special assignments and team building opportunities. We've put together a couple of um, team projects for patrol, uh, for people to get some exposure to detective work or undercover work. Uh, we also have afforded our employees opportunities to attend some fun um, community outreach um, experiences, including the golf classic um, at the Eugene Country Club, any of our special Olympics events, and then a weightlifting challenge um, from YouTube. We also have new work groups focused on diversity issues at EPD, and we're looking at dimensions in the workforce, including pathways to promote mentorship, education and training, tools and resources, and cultural elements, including implicit bias, respectful work environment, diverse perspectives, and safe spaces. EPD also has a robust peer support team that's department-wide, and we have a wellness initiative funds that are assisting with training, awareness, and resources. I was asked to speak about promotional process. I have limited information um, only because our promotion process is um, held by internally for um, special teams or assignments. Those go to the special team supervisor. And then the promotion process is handled by my division manager or sergeant and above. Um, we're currently looking at finding a consistent um, pathway to promotion. And we're hoping to have that outlined on our website when that is um, finalized. Um, and also our performance evaluation process. And those are all currently under review um, through command. That is the end of my very lengthy slideshow. Well, thank you very much for your report. Let's see if we have any hands or any questions. We can start with you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just have a request, not not for this evening, but um, to come back to us with information about. I'm specifically interested in um, the special units like SWAT and the drone and. You said the FTO and the honor. I'm interested in um, the participation of women and minorities in those um, areas. And if there's an underrepresentation, then I think that's something that um, we as a group might be interested in hearing about. So um, not today, but if, but if our staff perhaps could come back to us with a report, just you know, um, and and also as to how the how those units select. So that um, if, if a woman or a minority is interested in becoming a, a SWAT member or something, how how, how does that work? So, um, and for a future time, you know, if we could get that, thank you. Do we have any more, any more questions, Commissioner Commissioner Lundmans? Thank you, Chair. Um, two comments and two questions. Um, First of all, I just wanted to thank you for that very thorough presentation. It's really going to help our um, law enforcement mental health subcommittee do do our work. So thank you for everything you're doing there. And thank you for that presentation. And also one thing that I was so impressed on is that you're actually looking for people with diverse backgrounds and lived experiences. I think that's amazing. So I just wanted to give you a big shout out for that. Um, and then two, two quick questions. Um, so the slide went really quick about like where you're recruiting from. So I wasn't able to read the whole thing, but um, are you doing any active recruitment within the disability community? So that's number one. And then number two is about the the written exam. Can I take that personally just to see what, what they go through and like what, what the standards are? Um, I can get you a link to a practice test that would show you um, what the test looks like. Um, and we are doing a written test, um, like I said, this hiring process this weekend. And so I'll chat with our Eugene Resource Center. They facilitate that. 
And so I'll ask how I can get a practice link and then we can send it to all of you and you can take the practice test if you want to see what it's like. Um, and then you'll get a feel for uh, what the test is. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and um, just to my first question, are you doing any um, active recruitment for the disabled community? Yes, we are. Um, our Employee Resource Center sends out, um, and I think I had like 23 or 24 of the web-based um, platforms. So, I just couldn't see it all. So. Yeah, um, but they do specifically um, push out all of our hiring processes on those platforms, and they do um, reach out to ADA-specific um, platforms. Awesome. Thank you so much, and thank you again for the presentation and everything that you're doing. Commissioner Dominguez? Uh, yes. Um, I think the last time that you all presented to us, I think Jose was part of it, but he was only a volunteer. And as far as I understood it, he wasn't getting paid. Is he now actually part of the recruitment team and getting paid? So the last time he was not a part of the recruitment team, he was uh -huh. a new officer. And every time any of our staff participate in anything, they get paid. Oh, they do get paid. Oh, I was under the impression that he didn't get paid. And I was just like, that's kind of weird. Okay. No, I, I think he actually made overtime when he did the podcast. So. Oh, um, perfect. Okay, good. It was just that he wasn't sure. the designated uh, recruitment team member. I believe he was still on probation at the time of the podcast. And so we just um, brought him on the team now that he is um, meets the qualifications. He's off probation and he's still interested in helping. Perfect. And so that was the person that we saw very frequently in that recruitment video. Is that right? Uh, he, yes, he's one of them. Yes. Okay. Well, good job in including him because it made it look like I, I still don't know how many Hispanic people are on the police, but his presence was, you know, nice. Um, okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Appreciate it. Just wanted to know, make sure that, you know, it was like equal pay for equal work, but you did not fall. You did not fail there. So good job. Any more questions for Sergeant William? Um, so we, we definitely talked a lot about recruitment. And this kind of hits a little bit on retention, and I'm just genuinely curious. Um, what are like stats on retention over the years and exploring some of the trends? You know, like we had talked about younger generations and maybe not being interested in a full career. Um, I can think of maybe like three female officers who left within four months um, and went to our neighboring agency. I can think of a total of five probably within the past year and a half that went to our neighboring agency. So is it, can you maybe highlight some of the data points on the retention? Like, how are we keeping people here? How are we focusing that energy on keeping good people here? So historically, 20 to 25 officers has been our attrition number. That has not changed. Um, and although it's still, I know we've had some people exit the agency for different reasons. Um, internally, I know it feels like people are all of a sudden leaving. Since I've been hired, this has just been the way of the career. People have left for other agencies or different career paths. Um, Specifically with our neighboring agency, though, I've heard from several veteran officers of like 20 plus years, you know, folks that retired saying that this has been the highest that they've seen of folks going across the river to our neighboring agency. What um, is so the neighboring agency? So we all know what we're talking about. Yeah, Springfield Police Department. Oh, what? What? Okay, what? Um, so I'm just kind of curious, are we keeping stats on those things? Or are those something that we can show as far as retention, like why somebody left, like to actually have those stats versus, um, I think I can only think of like one person within maybe the past year and a half, two years that left for a new position, like totally outside of law enforcement. So I'm just kind of curious, like, what do those numbers look like? And do we have access to this? Uh, so I don't keep retention statistics. Retention is something extra I just take on because I care about the people that we hire. Um, that's not necessarily my job function. Um, so I think Clary is the person that would keep those statistics um, or our crime analysis unit. 
I do know um, that everyone, except for the last four that left for Springfield, not one of them is still retained in Springfield. Um, so all of those people that went to Springfield, uh, I think every single one of them got fired over there. Mm. No, mm. not the last three people. No, except for the last four people oh, who except left. For the last the five. five people who left before that yeah. have all been fired from Springfield. So um, I can't speak to the reasons um, that people leave here, but I say interviews with them. Um, sometimes. Are you doing exit interviews when they leave? I'm not in charge of exit interviews. Those are conducted by supervisory staff that oversee the employees. Exit interviews are being done and have been done with those three officers in particular. So we have some information. As far as a statistical extrapolation on that, that's really hard to do. Um, and there's some reasons, there's some philosophical reasons. Uh, the tempo of the agencies, certainly we have a higher tempo than Springfield does, for example. Our staffing levels, Springfield's fully staffed right now, mostly because they stole our cops. But, mm -hmm. you know, Springfield's fully staffed right now, which, you know, uh, deep burdens the officers. We know this. Uh, and then, you know, really, quite frankly, Springfield having its own municipal jail and um, housing people that commit low level offenses, which we don't have that opportunity here, is attractive to people in law enforcement. And those are some of the high level things that did come out of those exit interviews. Mm -hmm. There's some other pieces to it as well, as far as things that we need to work on internally that we can do better. Mm -hmm. okay. Commissioner Shiver? You're muted. Thank you. Um, to play off of, uh, not play off, but to expound on that a little bit, um, the main reason that I've heard of officers leaving um, has been frustration with a seemingly Sisyphean task and a lack of community support. Uh, this is not just limited to um, Eugene. This is also from my contacts back in Denver. So a limited sample size, but um, so those are the two main ones, and those are not directly necessarily within the department's um, control. Uh, I would be very interested in hearing more from a uh, dedicated retention, um, uh, somebody who's uh, dedicated to retention, because that's where most of my concerns are. I think our recruitment, um, it's, it's much better than when I joined the police commission. Um, and it's, you know, often unsung, even if we have concerns about um, one thing or another, it's it's 90% really good work, 10%, uh, you know, things we have questions on. Um, so when it comes to retention, I think there's more opportunity for us to uh, uh, make some gains there. I think our, our recruitment's doing well. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, Dr. Booker. Oh, yes. Um, nice PowerPoint. Very lengthy. Um, the video, uh, as we know, represent, representation matters. And I didn't think that that video represented really, and I'll try to look at it for different perspectives as a college student, as a high school student, as somebody that would be interested in being hired. It didn't really represent having a lot of Black police officers. Um, statistically, I think <sighs> there's not enough here. Um, and I think that that representation within the police force matters. And I know you guys recruited Hawaii, but I would like to know if you guys are focused on areas that are predominantly black elsewhere and trying to get those officers. And I think Chief Skinner said in the very first meeting a while back um, that they had recruited two black officers or interviewed and neither one um, accepted to stay on for whatever particular reason. Um, but I'm just wondering, is more being done given the racial climate past and future that's going to be coming is more being done to put an emphasis on having more black African-American officers on a police force, given that Eugene has the, the college which recruits a lot of black athletes. We have a lot of black businesses here. Um, there is a probably a more dense pop black population in Eugene than other places. So representation matters. So I'm just wondering, is more being done to recruit African-American, black, female, male police officers 
because in a video, I didn't really feel that, that that would make me want to be a part of it. It felt like a good old boy video. And I would like to see more, they would draw more, more culture in. We do still lack um, some diversity in our agency. And so I can only pull from what we have. Uh, we did have, I know there were three um, black officers, one female and two male in that video. Um, but all of the videos that we've made over the last year and a half, we have asked officers um, to participate, to show the diversity in our agency. Um, with that, sometimes officers uh, from those backgrounds don't want to participate in our outreach um, for, for whatever their reasons are. Um, and so that is a struggle that we have, but it is 100% um, on our minds and that something that we're trying to work towards. And, that, and that's all I brought up the whole point of like, I know he, she's going to mention recruiting Hawaii. So I was wondering mm -hmm. like maybe Dallas or Memphis or, you know, LA, places where you know that there's a, a black population or maybe getting more black officers to want to want to uh, be a part of the Eugene police force. If, yes. if, and that's if, why we if there's lacking it. within state recruiting. That's why we targeted our um, media ads, our social media and our radio ads in larger agencies like the Los Angeles area, even the Portland metro area. We did some over on the East Coast and even in like Thor uh, Florida and uh, the Alabama area. And um, it's hit or miss on whether we can get those applicants out here to Oregon. But All we right. are trying. All right. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a comment and then my hands be, being raised. I'm gonna have you. You had the last uh, question, um, Commissioner Dominga. So here, this is a suggestion. Um, so when they're doing those videos or they're doing the stuff, I think you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's that that stage of the game where I think you're, you're actors. Of, um, they don't have to be. They don't have to be. They do not have to be police from this place. Hire someone to play a police person to show a little bit of presence. Diversity, if there's not enough diversity in this place that you can use police people to get actors, is what I'm saying. You don't have, you don't have to use um, a policeman because, for all I know, the people, I don't know, they were all policemen there. They just had a uniform team that, to just show some diversity. And then I would put like Portland State on your list. And then I would literally have a conversation. And this is from the police. I was I can do the conversation, but have a conversation with those coaches, anyone, call Dan Lane, whatever. Listen, I, we would could you um could someone since someone from the police force do a presentation to some of these athletes and let them know this is something. Because the reason I say that is there's a former um, Oregon football player who's on the Springfield policeman. And his name is Alan um, Amundsen. 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 And, and, and and he I don't think he would be um, he would not be in, he would not help, he would want them to go to Springfield. What I'm saying is, is that he was sought after by Springfield. And so I was saying, so it's nice to do the, send out all this information to all these different agencies, but you you have to, just like y'all drive to make sure that they they have the correct information on their resumes, y'all do that type of thing. Don't send something to your vote. Someone needs to go and talk to someone. We do do that. So we go to every college okay. in person and do college fairs. We have had several sit downs with athletic teams at U of O. And we're want. also going to OSU. Um, we do have athletes apply. They just don't make it to the the actual employment seat um, at, the, at the finish line. Um, we ha just haven't been successful yet. We have tried to hire actors before um, and we had some pushback because we were told we were misrepresenting the diversity in our department by using there's, actors. There's, there's disclaimer in the box. And we just, I only know that from some, <laughs> these are, some of these people might be actors or something. So that's it. That's uh, all I have. This little suggestion. Yeah. Oh, to piggyback off of that, I was that was a good point that you brought up. But I know, um, given the climate and what's like, for instance, Black History Month is coming up, and that's not 
That month is not for us to talk about the atrocities, but more of the accomplishments and the way forward. So given that that's coming up, maybe something can be done in terms of Black History Month, in terms of recruiting, and uh, maybe some kind of, uh, I don't know, event or uh, some kind of something that revolve around recruiting during that particular month. Um, and that is showing a way forward and the accomplishments of where the Eugene Police Department is going in terms of culture and diversity. I just want to um, say it is eight o'clock. Is, 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 is your um, question long or do you, do you have we a quick question? Motion Mike? To... We, we're going to need to do a motion for five more minutes. Second. Move to extend for five minutes. Second. All those in favor? All those opposed? Okay. Commissioner Dominguez? Um, I was just wondering, um, thank you for saying the whole thing about like the jail thing and how basically officers feel like basically they just see the same people again and again and again because there is no jail um, here in Eugene. Uh, I was kind of curious about, um, you didn't really elaborate on other things though, like what are the internal reasons for people leaving? Um, the reason that I'm curious is because to me, it sounded like Officer Tester was saying that there were a lot of women that were leaving, which I'm kind of like, what's going on internally? Did I misunderstand you, Officer Tester? Uh, no, that's correct. Three women that I know of have left within the past four months. Four months which I, yeah. So I'm, I guess I'm, I'm asking because I'm wondering if there's something that I, I actually have thought it, I haven't followed through with it, but I have wanted to talk to more female officers to see what their experience is like at Eugene. So I guess I'm wondering um, what's going on. Um, can you elaborate on some of the internal reasons why uh, women are leaving possibly more specifically? I, I can do my best on that. I, I can tell you that, I mean, police culture is very difficult. It's been historically difficult for women in law enforcement. We know this. Um, Chief Skinner has built an internal um, work group with female officers to sit and talk about their experiences here within the organization and um, barriers particularly. And what are our, what are our steps forward? What is our path forward to make this a more, and, and I'll use a buzzword, but to, to make this a more inclusive place for everyone. And there's a, there's a significant priority here within the city about working on our belonging and belonging, you know, in a nutshell, everybody feeling like they belong under this roof and they're all part of the same team on the same equal way. Are we there? No, we're not. We know that. Uh, we're trying to work on these issues, um, you know, and in building a task force internally and engaging the people that are doing the work, uh, the women in this case, and trying to figure out how do we make this a better place? That's all we can do. I mean, at the end of the day, once we find out what's going on, yeah, then we can take that and we can move it. And we could try to change and continue to change some of our culture under this roof. But it's going to take time and it's going to take work. Can I we're see? Not there, we're not there right now. May I see the results of the surveys that you said? I, I believe in your presentation, you were saying that there were some surveys that were specifically asking officers what it is that they need in order to stay um, in uh, uh, Eugene. So um, um, do, may I, do I have access to this? Can I see these um, survey results? It wasn't a retention survey, and I can ask because it was a confidential survey for employees, but I'll I'll find out. Yes, and um, I think I possibly had suggested this many months ago. It'd be really great to see if uh, an actual survey that would be about retention specifically. Is that something that is planned um, at all? Do you know? I don't know. Okay. All right. Um, well, yes. Um, so Holly, if there's any way to connect me with that survey, that'd be great. And then um, um, Deputy Chief, if you might float that idea to um, the Chief, that'd be great because that would be really good to take a look at um, for retention. A survey, I mean, for retention. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Okay. We're going to move forward with our closing comments. Vice Chair Hawkins. I just received a message from former Commissioner when asking that I express his appreciation for Sergeant Julie Smith, uh, because she is absolutely an integral part of the work that we do with, with the Police Commission. And so directly from V, he says thank you. 
Thank you. Commissioner Dominguez. Closing comments. Uh, yes, um, I did want to add that 12.10.8 for the policy about cameras, I did want to say that we should be using the word used instead of removed data from the system. Used is used, I mean, used is not used, it should be used because removed makes things confusing. That's all, thanks. Commissioner Dr. Booker? Uh, yes, I guess um, I was just probably for Holly. Are we? Can we? Can you send us the um, complete uh, recruitment PowerPoint that was that was done? Yes, I can do that. Okay, thank you. And then um, just I want to thank thank the recruitment officer and the uh, deputy officer for uh, joining us today and filling in. And I appreciate you guys and all that you do. Uh, and let's let's keep making this a diverse force and inclusive. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Mozart. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I really don't have any closing comments at the time, at this time, but I, I wanna thank you guys for having a robust conversation about the police cameras. And I hope that we could come to a good conclusion on that on that end. Thank you. Commissioner Shivers. Yeah, um, I would like to Thank everybody, of course. Uh, and for the minutes, I'd like to take note that um, I would still be interested in talking to somebody specifically about retention. Um, uh, um, and then the third thing was, uh, when it comes to uh, updating the technologies to include um, uh, explicit uh, denial of uh, facial recognition and such, um, we might consider putting it under the emergent technologies uh, existing policy. I did look at it, and it is not as robust as um, uh, as I had in my head. So thank you all. Thank you. Commissioner Lemons. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to like sincerely say it. it's it's very good to reconnect with you all and Looking forward to rocking 2024. Let's do it together. Um, and then when it comes to my closing comments, I'm honestly really surprised that a motion to just like straight up ban facial recognition in Eugene law enforcement didn't pass easily. But, um, you know, especially considering the ad hoc, you know, committee's advice, but I see us tabling this as an opportunity to have a more informed discussion for me to get more informed and also to discuss other concerning emergent technologies. Um, and also to have Chief Skinner back so we can um, actually have some answers to our questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Councilor Yeh. Sorry, I'm having technical problems. Um, I don't have any closing comments, just glad to see everyone. Um, uh, Councilor um, Zelenka. Yeah. Uh, um... Thanks for that presentation and the recruitment and retention. That was very thorough and and uh, glad to see that our uh, our system is very robust. Um, and so that was very interesting. Thanks for doing that. Good job. Commissioner Judge Lehman. Thank you, Chair uh, Sergeant Williams. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to make a point that about three years ago, there was a commercial on television, like airing on Ducks games, that was really um, flashy and was about the cars and the dog and the, being on the field with the Ducks game. And what you showed us tonight was very different and felt much realer. And uh, it, what you put out there is what you get back. So, so when you know, I appreciate and I hope the trend. I, I also endorse the idea of diversity in these videos, but the tone of the video was so much nicer than the flashy "come come join us" because it's really cool to you know be a cop. So thank you for that as well. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna um, hold back on my closing comments and give Holly an opportunity because we, she needs to talk about our um, recruiting efforts. Mm -hmm. So you might have seen an email that I sent out earlier this week in regards to um, the open recruitment right now for CDBG and boards and commissions. And the police commission has six positions that are coming open. Um, and the deadline for applying is January 31st. 
So if you have it, for those of you that are eligible, you got an email from me. If you are interested in reapplying for another four years, please get your application submitted. For those of you that aren't, if you could please give me a heads up so that we'll know. Um, the other thing is um, we have a really tight turnaround. I'm going to be getting all the applications um, from the city manager's office to me on February 2nd. And then we have to have our recommendation to the mayor by February 23rd. So that's a quick turnaround for us to stand up a selection committee to review applications and then to invite people to come interview and then regroup and make our decision. So if you're interested in serving on that selection committee, please let me know. We'll need to have a chair for that. And I believe we need at least four members. If Holly, as the person who's leaving and not able to come back, I'd love to be able to sit in that position. Oh, All excellent. Right. Hey, Dave, can you hold on for one second? So um, um, these are the people that can join. We need at least three people. We have four with three. The people who um, need to send Holly, send Holly an email saying they want to be on the selection committee. And these are only the people who can do it. It's Sean, Commissioner Shivers, Commissioner Mogard, Commissioner Lehman, and Commissioner Lemons, and myself. Yes, that's it. So between those names I just said. So if you're saying right now, um, Commissioner Mogart, that you're willing, to, you're willing to be on that, bravo. So that's one. I'm two. So we just need to find, okay, Scott Lemons is three. I'm going to be applying for a position. So... I'm right now a liaison. I'm a member of the police commission, but I'm really a board member of CRB was my appointment. And I'm I'll, I'm telling Holly right now, I intend to apply for a Excellent. position on the police commission. Excellent. Okay, wonderful. So Excellent. Okay. As I would say. That well, I, 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 I want choice. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so just know we're gonna have to kind of move quickly on this because we have a short turnaround. So if you're interested, please send me an email and then I'll get with you and we'll you know discuss um, setting up our first initial meeting to talk about the process and start reviewing applications. And, I, and, and, oh, and then well, what's the scenario, um, um, Booker um, or both? Dr. Booker, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. So since um, the city of Eugene in 2023, the um, city council made a decision that um, you cannot serve on more than one commission. And so um, you'll need to decide if you want to, you know, reapply to the police commission or if you want to continue on with the HRC. And obviously, I want you here. So um, the city, city council, the city council is trying to stop me from being great. <laughs> um, we want you here. So I'm, I'm putting my bid in right now. Um, you have a question? Is there a hand up, Commissioner Mogart? Oh yeah, no. Um, but I'd be. I'd be willing to consider uh, chairing the the service. Excellent. Okay, do we need to do we need to make we need a to make a vote. We need to let's go ahead. Let's, let's go ahead and uh, okay. I would like to make a motion that Commissioner Mogart head up our recent uh, selection process. Second. Can I get a second? Second. So, okay, Commissioner um, Dominga, second. All those in favor of Commissioner Mogart um, heading our um, selection process, raise your hand. Aye. 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 All those, all those opposed say no. Okay. Commissioner uh, Mogart's heading that up. He, he's up saying a second. So um, um, it sounds to me that I'm on, I'm on myself, is on your committee. Commissioner Lemons is on commission. Did you say, uh, Sean, did you want to be on it? I'm working on campaigns this time around. I don't know. Who else was it? So we have you, we have Silver, we have um, Scott. I think that's that's, that's it. fine. That's it. Yeah. We, have, we, we have our three. That's all we need. That's all we need. So Sounds good. Okay. Are there any public comments? It looks like there's not. No. So oh, I would um, like to adjourn our meeting. Oh. Um, Holly, when did you need my answer by? Um, by January 31st. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I believe you can apply to all things, just so you know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It looks like we have no closing comments. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn the meeting. Second. 
All those in favor? All those opposed? Y'all can see you're going. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.